Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, from where you are. And uh, thank you to each of you. Thank you to each and every one of you for taking time to be here with us today to exchange on animal genetic resources of Reef Africa and their biobanking using the stem cells approach, the stem cell technologies. I am Christian Kiambutiambo from the Center for Tropical Livestock Genetic Resource based in Nairobi, in Kenya. And I'm co convening this webinar with uh, Isatu on Tebene from the Tropical Poultry Genetic Solution at Ilori, Ethiopia, and uh, Musa Hassan from Rosling Institute at University of Edinburgh in the UK. And today we have a wonderful lineup of speakers. We have Paul Butcher from FAO, Mary, Mary Bole Karuki from uh, AUAIBA, Adebabe Kebede from the Ethiopia Amara Regional Agricultural Research Institute. We have Dr. Sambuku from Cairo, Dr. Professor Ronald uh, Kugonza from McKinley, John Hu from Rosny Institute, and Tom Burden also from Rosny Institute. And at the end, we have uh, Efi who will be talking to us about the compliance when moving genetic material. So as the structure of this uh, webinar today, uh, after the two first presentation by our multilateral or regional uh, partners, FAO and AUIBA. We will have the first sessions of Q&A, just five minutes. Then we move to the second aspects of the talk with our national partners from Kenya, Ethiopia, and Uganda. Then we move to the second and the third uh, session of Q&A after the presentation from the partners from technologies. This is uh, John Ho uh, and Tom Bowden. We should be talking about, about the temp, stem cells and the AFI Kayemba, we should be talking about uh, compliance when moving uh, the genetic material. Please feel free to use the chat box to introduce yourself and your institutions and share with others and the QA box also to text your questions. And the webinar of today will be made uh, recorded and made available to us and through our different communication platforms and with partners institutions also. So before we start, allow me just to introduce to you, to give you a bit of background yeah. of this presentation. Oh. Yes, um, as background, we know that Africa at large and East Africa in particular is home to a rich biodiversity of indigenous animal genetic resources, which is essential for food security and poverty alleviation for millions of people in the regions. And these indigenous animal genetic resources possess unique adaptive traits, which uh, include uh, tolerance to disease and pest, tolerance to heat stress, feed and water source shortage, ability to cover long distances in search of food, and uh, to even survive on the marginal feed, among others. And these indigenous genetic resources also serve distinct use depending on the regions for socio-economical, cultural, and many other aspects in the African setting. But they are really threatened by many challenges. So conservations of these irreplaceable genetic resources uh, therefore become highly critical in Africa, and particularly in East Africa. And this is very important if we think Africa should continue benefiting from its rich diversity, of animal genetic resources, especially in the face of climate change, etc. And this could be achieved through an integrated approach, which consider both in situ and ex situ conservation strategies, as well as the packages of service to support farming practices within the communities. And we know that in the recent years, the Center for Tropical Livestock uh, Genetic and Health with the support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations and the UK uh, Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office. The CTHA, the Center for Tropical Lasto Genetic and Health, which is a co-creation of course between Hillary, SRC and Rosling Institute, established a number of protocols and piloted them in a number of countries for conservations of animal genetic resources, especially for poultry using stem cell approach. And the deployment of these are being with support from institutions like AUIBA. And now we are trying to push it up with tropical poultry solution 
uh, African Derigenetic Games, African National Partners like CALRO and many others, and also with the CGR Sapling Initiative. And this webinar is preparatory to uh, regional uh, wet lab biobanking trainings that will be happening in the region, aiming to present and familiarize participants with the gene banks operations, with conservations and restorations of local animal genetic resources using these uh, innovative technologies. And this is to contribute also to strengthen the capacities for conservation practices and uh, sustainable use. So ladies and gentlemen, we really think that uh, we are here at the right place and the right time, and together we can push forward this agenda, which is in line with the strategic uh, uh, development proposed by the FAO and AUIBA. And today our first presenter will be uh, Tom Bodden. Tom, are you there? Uh, sorry, Paul Butcher. Paul from FAO Italy. Paul, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Do you hear me? Yes, I'm getting you. Thank you very much. So uh, Paul is uh, an animal production officer and has been working for uh, almost more than 14 years at the FAO uh, Rome, Italy within the animal production and health division. And he has worked also as an outposted officer at the FAO IA division of nuclear technique in food and agriculture at the headquarter at the, in Vienna. And the primary activities of his work is to support countries to implement a global plan for action for animal genetic resources with particular emphasis on the conservations and on applications of biotechnologies like the stem cells technologies that we are trying to promote. And Paul has previously worked as a research scientist in Canada, in Italy, and at, uh, of course, at the IE. And he has author and co-author more than 200 scientific publications on matters of animal genetic resources. And currently he's serving as a secretary of the Intergovernmental Technical Working Group for Animal Genetic Resources within the Commission of Genetic Resources and Food, uh, for Food and Agriculture. So we are facing the right person today to talk about uh, the new guidelines on crop conservations and genomic characterizations of animal genetic resources. Um, and uh, of course, um, domestic animal diversity information system. So please, uh, Tom, uh, Paul, you have the floor. You can share your screen and uh, make your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll, I'll see if it works. Yes, wonderful. We can see it. You can put it on presentation mode. OK. So I'll just start by thanking Christian and the rest of the organizers for uh, inviting to speak about our new FEO guidelines for the management of animal genetic resources. I'd also like to recognize my colleagues, Rosita Baumung and Gregoire Lois, who helped me prepare this presentation and also contributed to preparing the guidelines. So why are animal genetic resources important? Well, I'm sure most of you already know these answers, but I'll just give some uh, background anyway. Uh, animal genetic resources are an essential part of the biological basis for world food security. More than 1 billion people rely directly on livestock for a major proportion of their livelihoods, and the livestock value chains employ you know, other billions of people. A diverse resource base is critical to reach FAO's goal of eradicating world hunger. This uh, diversity of animal genetic resources allows populations to adapt to current and future environmental constraints, both due to markets or things like uh, climate, for example. And then this diversity serves as the raw material for breeders to make genetic improvements. Although individual breeds are, and animals are generally held privately, this diversity is an international public good, and therefore there is a logical role for UN in, in the form of FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations in global coordination of managing this diversity. As far as the roles and re responsibilities of FAO, 
To generalize, we collaborate with member countries to support their efforts to implement the Global Plan of Action for Animal Genetic Resources. So what is this Global Plan of Action? It's the only internationally developed and adopted plan to improve the management of the world's animal genetic resources. It is a policy document which was developed and then endorsed by the members of the FAO conference in 2007, and then reaffirmed with another resolution in 2017. The Global Plan of Action contains 23 different strategic priorities for action, which aim to address both the current and future challenges to the livestock sector. These 23 priorities are grouped into four different strategic priority areas, characterization, inventory, and monitoring, which is really the first step in managing animal genetic resources, sustainable use and development, conservation, which is the topic of our discussions today, of course, and then the policies, institutions, and capacity building, which support the actions in the other three priorities. Among the other rules and, res and responsibilities of FAO, on monitoring then the status of the implementation of the Global Plan of Action, as well as monitoring the state of global animal genetic resources, which is done based on inputs from countries. We also work to raise awareness and to promote animal genetic resources issues internationally. We also establish or strengthen international information sharing, research, and education. To give an example of information sharing, I'll use the DADIS, the Domestic Animal Diversity Information System. DADIS is, uh, we see the URL here. I, I assume these slides will be shared later. It's the web interface of the global database of livestock breeds. This includes more than or nearly 9,000 different breeds and over 15,000 different national breed populations. These represent 37 different species groups of traditional livestock, as well as managed bee species. Datus allows countries to document the presence of given livestock breeds in their countries and also their wild relatives, as well as to describe their characteristics. Data serves as a convention of biological diversities, clearing health information for animal genetic resources in order for countries to evaluate you know, the state of this critical form of biodiversity. It is also the source of data for Sustainable Development Goal Indicators 2.51b and 2.52, which deal with, with uh, cryoconservation and in situ conservation, respectively. This slide uh, shows some screenshots of data. So you can see, say, the homepage, an example of uh, breed information, and then a demonstration of the fact that graphs can be you know, created using the data functions. As far as other roles and responsibilities, we promote international cooperation, develop partnerships. That is why we very much like to work you know, together with ILRI, an example, and for the, with the Center for Tropical Livestock. Uh, we also work to build capacity, you know, such as through training workshops, such as this one, either ones we run ourselves or cooperating with collaborators. And then we provide technical support to countries. This can be done by implementing and backstopping projects, developing international technical standards and protocols, and technical guidelines is what I've been talking about the remainder of my presentation. So among the strategic priorities of the Global Plan of Action is to develop international technical standards and protocols. This is important because some countries may lack the knowledge or familiarity with the most effective and up-to-date methods and protocols for management of animal genetic resources. And also application of standardized approaches facilitates information sharing, and evaluation of implementation across countries. FAO, throughout the last, say, 10 years, has developed, through the cooperation of experts, a group of different technical guidelines. This uh, slide here shows the range of guidelines that we had developed in the past, and then it can be 
divided across the different strategic priority areas. Most of these guidelines were developed soon after the adoption of the Global Plan of Action in 2007. Although most of them remain fully applicable, there are some other instances where technology has advanced rapidly so that updating the guidelines has been warranted. For example, in cryoconservation or gene banking, uh, genomics, reproductive physiology, and cryobiology technologies have advanced rapidly, as has there been a change in utilization of material with more support for the breeding of an in situ populations, not just using gene banks as some sort of repository and insurance for against breed extinction. And also in molecular genetic characterization, there have been huge advances in genomics over the past 10 years, and also in the analytical method, methods for the data. Therefore, FAO has recently developed new guidelines on these two topics. And this just shows the cover of the two guidelines. Both of them are available online. So with regard to cryoconservation from 2016 to 2020, FAO was a partner in the European Union Horizon 2020 project called IMAGE. And IMAGE stands for Innovative Management of Animal Genetic Resources. IMAGE generated numerous research results for improving cryoconservation programs. And one of the deliverables of IMAGE was an assessment of the previous FAO guidelines on cryoconservation and then proposal of contents for an updated version. Therefore, we gathered scientists from the IMAGE partner institutions and we coupled them with co authors from other institutes across the world to allow a balance internationally. And then scientists from Nordic Gen Genetic Resources Center, which was a partner in IMAGE, also served with me as co editors. So I'll just give you an overview of the content. Uh, the chapters are somewhat arranged in chronological order if you're running a gene bank. It starts out with building a gene bank strategy. Then it goes into implementation and organization with an emphasis on quality management systems for gene banks. It then goes into choice of biological materials. For example, whether semen or embryos, oocytes or some other type of cell is the best based on your situation and the species. Chapter four is looking at economics of gene banking. And this is a new development. We don't look at not only the cost of gene banking, but also the returns and then some economic analyses which can be used to, you know, to make an economic strategy. Chapter five is based on developing and using collections and it also details how genomics can be used to help manage the diversity in a gene bank. Section six then looks at collection and crowd preservation of germplasmic tissue and it includes different uh, appendices which give step-by-step -step you know, details on how these methods can be applied to different species. This includes not only livestock, as I mentioned, but also honeybees. Section seven is on sanitary issues because it's important you, that you, you do not crowd preserve pathogens along with your precious genetic material. Section eight is on database and documentation because more and more the information associated with genetic resources is almost as valuable as the resources themselves. Section nine is legal issues, which involve the exchange of genetic material, both from the original provider to the gene bank, and then from the gene bank to the users. It also discusses the Nagoya protocol, which we'll have detail later today in this, in this webinar, because that's critical when resources are, are shared across borders. And then the final section is on capacity building and training. And this also includes outreach with the community. With regard to GEMA characterization, FAO has a long history of cooperation with the International Society for Animal Genetics, better known as ISAG. In fact, one of the standing committees within ISAG is called the ISAG FAO Advisory Group 
on animal genetic re resource diversion. So a lot of times if FAO needs some outside advice on genomics, we work with members of ISIM. For example, as members of this advisory group have led previous developments of FAO guidelines dating back to 30 years ago. This started with the secondary guidelines on management of animal of domestic animal diversity. And then ISAG members developed recommended microsatellite markers for standardizing analyses in 2004. They also helped us to divide the last issue of guidelines based on molecular characterization of animal genetic resources in 2011. Therefore, it was natural that current and past members of this advisory group served as editors for the new guideline. And then these editors also helped us choose authors for the specific topics, many of themselves being ISAG members. So just go over the content of these guidelines. It starts out with an introduction on both the history of genetic characterization and a forward looking what would be happening in the future. It then goes over the basics of preparing for a genomic characterization study and then working with the community to get your samples. Uh, the section three is based on genomic tools and examples. It looks in more detail at genome sequencing uh, using SMP chips, genotyping by sequencing, and then also imp imputation of genomes. Section four is on applications of genomics, looking at uh, studies in, such as the methods to estimate genetic variation from the population, and also on analyses such as GWAS and selection signature. So in conclusion, animal genetic resources are an important public good for food security. And FAO members have an intergovernmental process for assessing the management of animal genetic resources and for guiding their implementation of the Global Plan of Action. FAO provides technical assistance to countries and monitors the status of animal genetic resources. Two new guidelines on cryoconservation and genomic characterization of animal genetic resources have been recently paired with the input by international experts. And both of these guidelines are available online with the URL you see here. And as I said before, no need to copy this down as I'm sure these presentations will be shared. So with that, I'd like to thank you. Uh, and we can move on to the next speaker and I'll be hanging around if you have any questions for the discussion section at the end of this webinar. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul, for this wonderful presentation, which is uh, putting more light on the animal genetic resources and the work uh, you are doing at the FAO for the countries, particularly those from the global side would need uh, these tools. So we thank you very much for uh, the guidelines that we have put forward. Those for conservation, particularly as we see how it is structured, from building the gene bank strategy, implementations, economic uh, gene banking, et cetera, and uh, up to the capacity building and legal issues that this is important. And this is really what we need from the different regions of Africa, particularly as uh, Africa unions have been putting in place uh, the regional gene banks we are now being transformed into center of excellence of animal genetic resources in Africa. So it will be important to hear also from uh, Mary, who should be telling or talking to us about the state of conservation of farm animal genetic resources. From uh, Mary is uh, uh, Mary, are you there? Are you, get, are you getting us? Good afternoon, Christian. Yes, I am. Okay, um, thank you. Yes, please. Maybe I can okay. share the screen. Or... Yes, maybe uh, Paul could stop sharing to allow okay. you to share. Can you share now, Mary? Yeah, I think you're still on. I cannot share, please. Okay. Uh, I put... 
Okay, um, now, now it's yes, is it possible? Okay. Yes, wonderful. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Yes, thank please. you, thank you, Paul, and thank you, Mary. Uh, uh, colleagues, allow me to introduce uh, Mary. Uh, Dr. Mary Bole Karuki is uh, currently the Technology Innovation and Skill Development Expert at the African Union and Inter African Bureau for Animal Resources, AUIBA. And uh, she studied uh, genetics and genomics, respectively, at the University of Ghana, University of Edinburgh, and uh, Nottingham, where she obtained her PhD. And uh, she is, Mary is currently providing strategic leadership and direction uh, at the uh, a scaling up development and optic of inclusive innovations and technologies, especially animal biotechnologies and digital applications that will address various uh, livestock food system challenges and target and target the vulnerable communities in the, across Africa. And Mary is also currently leading the promotion of conservation and sustainable utilization of animal genetic resources, and she is the one coordinating the operationalizations of African Union Animal Resource Center of Excellence across Africa. And prior, uh, before joining uh, AUI by Mary has worked with ILRI and uh, also with ECP where she contributed greatly to generating knowledge and information for various stakeholders and many countries in Africa, almost all countries I would say in Africa have benefited from her support and management. So please, Mary, you have the floor to make your presentation. And uh, just let the participant know that now the uh, chat is enabled to introduce yourself and your institutions and the Q&A to text your questions. Thank you. Mary, you have the floor. Thank you, Christian. I appreciate the introduction. And uh, I just want to say good afternoon and good morning to all those who have managed to join us in this webinar. So allow me to just take you through what you basically uh, talked about conservation. And for me today, my main, you know, sorry, I'm having a challenge with, um, Christian. Yes, Hello? you can share it. Yes, you can share your screen again. You just stop sharing. Yeah. Yes, you can see it. You can see it, yes. but it is um, unfortunately it is not moving forward. Oh, hmm. I Please, I did not... share it with you, so you can also share it. Can you just yeah. take over the control of the uh, uh, the thing, Mary, if you can? Of which thing? of the Zoom session. Sorry, I think maybe that's that's why you can't... Uh, mm -hmm. I, let me see where you are. Okay. All right. Can, can you put it on, on a presentation mode again? There we go. And it still doesn't yes. move? No, it is moving. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Musa, for that. So I just focus mainly on what we have done as AUI, and this is mainly to just share with you a report on the establishment of the five regional gene banks on conservation and utilization of animal resources, as well as bring in some insights on the endorsement of these centers to becoming African Union animal seed centers of excellence. Um, hmm. Okay, we are back to the same problem. Sorry, I don't know what's happening. Uh, uh, right. <laughs> happening. I don't know what's going on. And so at, in mm -hmm. that state, can you move the next slide without going to the presentation mode? Yes, when I get off and on, I can. Okay, let, let's give it a try. If it doesn't work, I'll ask Christian to put it on his screen and then I can move on. My apologies to the participants. I do know what is going on on my end. So just a brief introduction, and I think Paul has already raised that, and I'll just go quickly through this, that Africa is a livestock-rich continent, which represents a third of the livestock population. So definitely, matters are pertaining livestock are critical to the African population. 
we can see that almost 3.350 million people depend on livestock in Africa and that the products are rich sources of um, protein. So it is very critical for us to push forward in terms of um, transforming the continent and as well as achieving the issues in terms of the Malabo Declaration and the Agenda 2063 aspirations. So looking at the genetic resources in Africa, we have a total number. This is based on a publication that AU Iba did in the year of 2019. We have a total number of breeds of 2,250. 2, and uh, I just tried to put a graph together just to show you the, you know, of, of the big five, what is really there. We have in cattle, sheep, 363 breeds, goats, 289 breeds, pigs of 146 breeds, poultry to 329. So in total, we also have 431 emerging or non-conventional species. This is a publication that we shared nationally and also continentally and regionally. It is also available on our website. So what is the status in Africa in terms of um, the populations? Um, this is based on the far resource of 2021. And we can see that really in Africa, we have around 27, breeds that are at risk, not at risk 67 and known 719. And this is something that needs to really draw our attention. If you look at the total number of those that are also unknown regionally are 75, internationally 69. So we really are working with our populations that we don't know their status in terms of risk, whether they are endangered or threatened. And in total, we have a total of 36 mammalian and three avian breeds that have been reported as extinct. So this is, shows the number of animal genetic resources that we have. And um, sorry, this, can you see? Yeah, we can see, I think. It's still maybe. moving, huh? Yeah, it's moving if you go out of the presentation mode. Okay, there we go. Yeah, I'm having, I think when I get off and back, it's when it comes back. All right, so we are really looking at what was really pushed forward. And these are in terms of the recommendations that were made. And during the ninth conference of African ministers in 2013, it was recommended that animal resources need to be conserved. We need to look at the sustainable utilization of animal genetic resources and especially those that are adopted to local conditions. And this is really in relation to the fact that we need to look at local breeds that are well suited to our African production systems so that we don't have to put in a lot of resources in terms of production, especially when we bring in exotic breeds, which adds more pressure, production pressure to the um, farmers. So LIDESA was developed and uh, in the LIDESA strategy, in the strategy 6224, we were asked to design and implement innovative and sustainable breeding and conservation programs at national and regional level. And this is why we brought forward to the ministers the agenda, the actions that we had to do. Also in strategy 6.27, we were asked to create an enabling environment to institutionalize and generate incentives for enhancing livestock ecosystem services including biodiversity service. So yet again, the issue of conservation was pushed forward. Now, the Malabo Declaration really stressed the significance of conservation and sustainable use of natural resources. And this is something that has continued to push the actions for Africa. In the recent Agenda 2063, the first aspiration is really based on inclusive growth and sustainable development, and also pushes for biodiversity conservation. Under the Global Plan of Action of FAO, again, it has highlighted in the GPA the need for conservation of animal genetic resources and also the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals calls again for conservation and risk status. So with this put on the, you know, pushing our agenda forward through the genetics project, we were able to come up with the establishment of five regional gene banks for creo conservation, and mainly what was the agenda was to support countries with national, without national genetic gene banks to access cryoconservation facilities, as well as provide a backup storage 
provide storage of genetic materials for transboundary breeds, as well as drive an agenda of promoting utilization of unique adaptive traits, which are very well um, exhibited in our indigenous breeds. This includes drought tolerance, disease tolerance, you know, feed and water, they're able to survive in very harsh conditions, resilience, which are critical to um, climate change. So through the genetics project, we established five regional gene banks. We have one that is in Southern Africa region, hosted in Botswana at the Department of Agriculture Research uh, DA in Gaberone. The West African region has the regional gene bank hosted in Burkina Faso, Arsirdes in Bobo Dialaso. Central Africa region, the University of Chang in Cameroon hosts the gene bank. Northern Africa region, Tunisia hosts the gene bank at the Bank National de Jean in Tunis. The Eastern African region hosts our gene bank in Nagrik in Entebbe, Uganda. So we came up with various um, um, documentation that were necessary to drive the regional gene banks. And one of the most important one was the memorandum of understanding. This was reviewed and it was agreed and it was something that was meant to be signed by member states, the sub-regional focal point, the REC, and AUIBA. Then we have the standard operating procedures, which are also available for collecting, handling, and storage, as well as processing, legal and administrative guidelines for the movement of animal genetic resources, as well as a material transfer agreement that was cleared by the African Union Office of the Legal Council. So as we put all these things in place, I must highlight that we faced a bit of challenges in the operalization of the regional gene banks. And therefore it was, we, we, bore, we bore the need to try and change these regional gene banks to become centers of excellence and widen their mandate so that we could have member states and all the recs involved and to become part and parcel of driving the agenda on conservation on the continent. So the first main mandate was to support development and implementation of continental conservation programs. So moving away from just storing genetic material, but rather getting practical, building not only infrastructural capacity, but also technical capacity. So we wanted also to look at the development and implementation of prior conservation strategies for animal genetic resources we had already started on this, but we also faced a bit of hiccups because of, again, technical incapacities. Then training of stakeholders to develop and adopt innovative technologies. And I've seen Paul has shared a publication on that. This is something that really needs to be shared widely and adopted to drive the agenda in terms of building technical capacities. Then promote inter and intra regional sharing of genetic material, promote sharing of best practices and lessons learned, and then push the agenda in terms of biotechnology. The first one was drive the agenda of the adoption of continental guidelines for the harmonization of seed regulatory frameworks. Also the agenda on continental guidelines on the use of biotechnology, as well as presenting ourselves as a platform for advocacy and awareness creation on sustainable utilization of local breed genetics. And this is something that is very critical. So, during this fourth steering committee, the ministers were really supportive of what we had proposed. And at the end of the meeting, they endorsed our preposition. So they took note of the reports on the selection process of the five regional gene banks as regional gene banks, endorsed the recommendations of the reports on the selection of the five regional gene banks. So it's important for me to highlight that these were actually assessed before we pushed them forward to become regional gene banks. They were first national gene banks. The ministers also endorsed the five regional gene banks as African Union Animal Resources Seed Centers of Excellence. The ministers also urged the African Union Commission in collaboration with the RECs to support the eporalization and sustenance of the five African Union Animal Resources Seed Centers of Excellence as well as called upon the African Commission to support the establishment of a continental backup center at AU Panva. So we now have a continental backup center that will store um, 
all the genetic material that will be collected across the regions. They also requested the AU Commission to support the adoption of the continental guidelines for the harmonization of the seed regulatory frameworks. They also requested the African Union Commission to support the adoption of the continental guidelines for biotechnology. And I think this is something that we will need to come back and talk about because the centers, the, the continental guidelines were very, very biased towards the crop sector. And the livestock sector really needs to be included in these um, guidelines to push our agenda forward in relation to the use of biotechnology. They also requested the African Union Commission to mobilize resources for the operationalization of these cent centers of excellence, as well as a backup for continental gene bank. So what are the ongoing actions in relation to this after they were endorsed at the, as African Union Seed Centers of Excellence? We were able to establish continental technical working group to support the operationalization of this. And it is through this group that we were able to initiate various actions. We initiated the assessment and development of a continental strategy, which is actually hopefully going to commence by this month. We also signed an MOU with ASAREKA to provide guidance on the signing of the East African MOU. During the continental meeting that we held, we were able to also develop a guiding framework for the operationalization. And you can see it's a bit faint, but that's basically the organogram of the African Union Animal Resources Seed Centers of Excellence. We start with the farm associations, research organizations, we move to the national focal points, the ministries, the agencies, that is basically where the center is hosted. Then we move to the AUC, AU African Union Seed Centers of Excellence, then the sub-regional focal points. This is where Asareka, Kadesa, INRA come in. Then we have the RECs, the Livestock Technical Committees, Council of Ministers, and AUIVA overall. We also develop an assessment criteria for evaluation of the African Union Animal Centers of Excellence. This I can share with you because I had a short time, but there is an assessment criteria, which is what we are using to assess what we have to identify the, pay, the gaps that we need to cover in terms of infrastructural capacity, biosecurity, human capacities, capacities for training, so that we can really action these things that we are talking about that still remain abstract, but need to be made come to reality. We also have a, the development of an action plan for the operationalization of these national continental states. So we've also come up with something that I need to mention here. We were also, for the first time, we were able to push an agenda for the CADAP, livestock seed indicators. For the first time in the biennial review for uh, the agricultural program for AUC, we are going to be able to assess the degree of usage of local indigenous seed across the continent. So what we are looking at is really trying to see what is the percentage of local uh, genetic material that is used vis-a-vis -vis the exotic material and try to come up with a way to see whether we can get to a 5% increase in terms of the generational inter intervals. So this is something that is in the pipeline. This is the first time it has been integrated as an indicator, and we are looking forward to being able to push the agenda of conservation, because now we will be able to say, this is the degree of usage of local genetic material. We need to conserve it, we need to preserve it, we need to sustainably utilize it. So in terms of resource mobilization, we've been moving forward with our agenda, and uh, there has been some commendable actions in relation to that, supporting to the African seed centers, even looking at it in terms of One Health actions. And it is our hope that through these um, interventions, conservation and preservation of our local breeds is going to be pushed at a higher level. Not forgetting that at national level, the gene banks are still weak. So we need to strengthen our national gene banks. Then we push forward to the regional level and eventually to the continental level. I want to thank you so much for your kind attention. And um, asante ni sana, merci, obrigado, shukran. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary, for your wonderful presentation.
And I'm sure it is giving uh, more confidence to the regional stakeholders of the animal genetic resources in the region that with you, with AUIBA, and uh, with the inclusions of the activities for the biobanking of animal genetic resources in Africa into the cadet and the leadership assigned to Asareka, we should be able to transform the, the to make a big transformation on the ground and to make sure that the use of local and locally adapted seeds and certified seed are also uh, well captured on the ground. So thank you very much, Mary and uh, Paul for this first session of the presentation. Now for the Q&A, is there any questions? Musa, can you see any question here? I can see a hand from the Rosalind. Let me uh, just give me a second um, to see if there's any question in the chat. Uh, not, not that that I can see unless someone I can't see a hand. Can you see a hand? You said. I think maybe it was just a mistake from Rosalind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I get. I think what I would want or just to set it off back to Mary, the resource mobilization bit. I, 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 do you mind elaborating on that? What do you mean by resource mobilization in the context of conservation? Like what does a, a U, I, B, exactly mean when they discuss uh, resource mobilization? Thank you so much, Musa. Um, so basically what we were looking into is really to drive an agenda to create more awareness on the importance of conservation and creole conservation, especially of local indigenous animals. And what we were doing is we have approached a few development um, partners and we are looking at, for example, Christian is aware of this, we are really pushing forward the establishment of a seed animal seed um, industry, you know, try to push an agenda that speaks to the animal seed, like the crop sector has. You know, when you ask for certified seed for crops, you actually get certified seed. But when you ask for certified evaluated seed for animals, you get exotic animals presented to you. So we felt the need for Africa to push an agenda, not only to conserve, but to sustainably utilize by really building up a seed industry that will be recognized in terms of improving food and nutritional security. So those are, that's one of the ideas, but we've had the various actions and we are still working on this. And we are hoping that um, once the development partners push the agenda forward, we will be able to drive forward our actions on conservation. And not really, allow me to emphasize, not conservation per se, but sustainable utilization, because there's really no need of telling a farmer, please conserve this animal when it brings no monetary value to them. Thank you, Mary. Uh, just to to clarify, I see some people still on the Q&A saying the chat is disabled. I don't know if they can type their questions just in the Q&A section. Forget about the chat if you can not type on there. Uh, Thanks, Mary. Uh, uh, Christian, you have any question? Or anyone uh, has any question? From my end, just to thank Mary and Paul for this wonderful beginning of our presentations. And uh, while waiting for the questions to come, as people should be typing, we can move to the next presenter. Christian, with, I, I see, sorry, I see a hand from Samuel Buko from my end. Yeah, sorry. Yes, Sam, please. Please, Sam. Thank, thank you, thank Mary. You. Thank you, Mary, for that presentation. Um, just wondering on the MTAs. Where are we? Because, um, for example, from Kenya, I've not heard of, about this conversation. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Sam. So um, these um, MTAs were actually developed for all of us and were shared with our national 
Animal Genetic Resources Coordinator. I think at that time, uh, trying to remember his name, but anyway, we shared all this with the ministries to be able to share them with you because this was something that we hope would be between regions, between countries, ETC, which is a continental MTA agreement for all member states. So I will definitely share this with you, Sam, so that you can have an idea. I can even share it with more of us. I can share this with Christian too, so that people can have more of an idea because these are the challenges we face. As long as you don't have information on these matters, then we continue to remain in the status that we are in. Even for the MOU, we faced the same challenge because countries did not have access to the MOU, thus they were not sure what they are signing into. So we can share these protocols with you, Sam, so that we can drive the agenda forward. And I think this will be important, Christian, if you allow me just to say quickly, will be important yes, for what we are starting now. So we have pushed forward a mobile um, center of excellence with um, Samuel Mboku, Kalro, and Kagrik, uh, which is going to serve the region where we are taking our genetic material across the borders to the various um, especially pastoralists, to drive and drive the agenda of certified and evaluated locally available um, seed. So if we have these MTAs, then I think with the transfer agreements, it will be so much easier. And these even mobile centers can move further because our, our drive is to get more access to the people who need it at the grassroots level. Thank you. Uh, Christian, I don't know if there's time for just one question for Mary, then we can move on. Yeah, uh, we can. Uh, the last question, you can see Paul Juma. There is there is one on on the Q&A chat. So I think this is from Rosalind Wambugu. I don't know if she wants to ask the question or if I just read it out. Okay, just read it out so that uh, we move quickly. So uh, Rosalind is asking, uh, does the e AUIBA support national organizations when it comes to strength strengthening national gene banks? Okay, thank you so much and uh, uh, greetings to Rosalind. So yes, this is actually one of the things I said at the very end of my presentation, we realized that if we strengthen the regional centers of excellence and the national gene banks remain weak, then that will be a situation that will be very tricky because we expect the national gene banks to populate the regional gene banks. So we are hoping that with this idea, as I said about the seeds industry, we are going to drive an agenda of strengthening the national gene banks so that we can strengthen the regional gene banks in terms of access to genetic material. And, and I know Rosalind had even tried, we were hoping to support you in relation to the uh, conservation strategy, for, um, the gene banking strategy, which uh, FAO had trained us on. Um, so these are some of the things that we are hoping to do, to go to Kagrik, to Nagrik, develop gene banking strategies for them. And that way you will be a strengthened institution to now assist with um, supporting the regional centers of excellence. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thank Mary. you, Mary. Yes, and I propose uh, Paul Juma will uh, type his questions on the chat, the Q&A, then we move ahead with the, the next uh, presenter who is uh, Adebabe Kebede. Adebabe, are you there? Yes, I'm there, Christian. Okay, thank you so much. Allow me to introduce you to the participants. So uh, Dr. Adebabe Kebede is the director of the Endosa Livestock Research Center and the researcher in animal breeding and genetics with more than 19 years of uh, professional experience in livestock research and development, mainly on chicken. And uh, Adebabe work on the whole genome characterization of village chicken in Ethiopia, comprises 27 chicken populations. This was for the requirement of his PhD, and it was done on the, with support from Ilri and the CTLGH. And besides, he was involved in designing uh, strategies for the conservation uh, and the improvement of livestock in the Amara region in Ethiopia, 
while also serving as member of the technical and advisory committee for livestock fish face and sector development program in that region. Please, Adebabe, you have the floor to talk uh, to, to enlighten us on local poultry genetic resources in the regions and their conservation status. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, uh, thank you, Christian, uh, you and your team, uh, because I have got the opportunity to talk uh, after two senior members from African Union and uh, from FAO. And I was also actually very grateful and uh, privileged uh, to hear their talks. So having said this, I think I have give, been given this title actually uh, on uh, local poly, uh, poultry genetic resource in Af East Africa and their conservation uh, status. So uh, I used the literature from different sources, from web sources and uh, tried to uh, at least capture as much as uh, information as possible uh, regarding all these uh, countries or East African countries. So this is my outline. Actually, uh, I will go through the introduction and uh, the current the indigenous chicken population in East Africa challenges the conservation status uh, of IC indigenous chicken in East Africa. And what is, why uh, are we pressed uh, or what is the need for conservation uh, will be actually highlighted. And finally, I will have a kind of conclusion and uh, the way forward. So uh, many sources actually tell uh, East Africa uh, mainly depend, uh, East African community depend on agriculture uh, for employment and uh, livelihood opportunity. And the livestock sector, including the poultry sector is part of the agricultural sector that contribute uh, tremendously uh, about 20 to 30% of the national uh, GDP. Uh, in East Africa, uh, we, the over 80% of the human population, they live, uh, are actually reported to live in rural areas of which 75% of them uh, keep household, uh, keep indigenous chickens. Um, when it comes to the importance of the indigenous chickens in East Africa, uh, they are actually used for many uh, purposes for social, uh, cultural aspects, economical aspects, and uh, they are actually helping the rural uh, poor community. Uh, basically, in terms of the production system, uh, most of the IC are produced under extensive or uh, village scavenging system, uh, characterized by provision of few uh, inputs. And uh, uh, these days, the uh, poultry sector in Africa is also uh, being reported to uh, grow, uh, particularly the commercial aspect because of the urbanization and uh, the growth of the middle class in the East African uh, subcontinent. Uh, even the, uh, the ratio of village to commercial chicken is actually different from the different countries. Uh, and it is believed that the commercial poultry is increasing uh, day by day, but the largest volume of both eggs and poultry meat is uh, still coming from uh, the uh, indigenous uh, chicken. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see the uh, characterized uh, ecotypes in East Africa. Uh, in Ethiopia, we have, as far as the literature uh, uh, reports, uh, Ethiopia has characterized 31 uh, ecotypes. Uh, Kenya has characterized nine. Uh, Tanzania has characterized 10. Uganda, 12. Uh, Sudan and South Sudan altogether has characterized five. Rwanda, four. Somalia five and Eritrea uh, has characterized none. And uh, this all characterization actually depend on mainly phenotypic characterization studies. Uh, and in some countries actually, uh, there are some molecular aspects, uh, microsatellite plus uh, mitochondrial uh, DNA studies. Uh, regarding the poultry population and indigenous pro uh, chicken proportion, uh, Tanzania has actually the highest uh, population uh, or in millions, 72 millions, uh, million heads, and of which uh, more than 56%, about 56% comprise the indigenous chicken. Ethiopia has about 57 uh, million population, and of which 79 is uh, indigenous chicken, before it was about 90%, but now the uh, dissemination of exotic chicken is getting high, so 
is going down. The proportion of indigenous chicken is going down. In Kenya, uh, there are about 54 million uh, chicken, of which 75% are uh, believed to be uh, indigenous uh, chicken. Uh, when you come to Uganda, they do have about 48 million uh, chicken and 88% uh, of it is indigenous uh, chicken. In Malawi, uh, we have uh, 12 million uh, popula chicken population, uh, including uh, the other uh, variants of poultry, and 90% of them are indigenous uh, chicken. In Rwanda, uh, we have about 7 million, sorry, uh, the proportion of indigenous chicken is 4.3. Uh, sorry, it says 64 by mistake. In Eritrea, I have got a report of 1.1 million chicken. And uh, actually, uh, the report doesn't mention whether it is the total poultry or the indigenous chicken. But I believe that only few introduction of commercial chicken is reported in one uh, district. So I think this about 1 million is uh, indigenous chicken. Uh, Different uh, merits of IC are actually reported uh, in uh, East Africa uh, from different uh, literatures, which I mentioned actually. Uh, people uh, are using the IC chicken for uh, economic, social, and cultural purpose. And the meat and egg is, egg is actually preferable uh, compared to the improved uh, chicken. Uh, and they are believed to have a unique adaptation to the local environments, uh, including thermal stress, drought, pathogen, and suboptimal uh, nutrition. This is actually the reports about the uh, ICs of uh, East African countries. Uh, and IC are actually uh, uh, valuable. Uh, pe people they, uh, or reporters mentioned that uh, IC are valuable reserves of genes for adaptive and economic uh, traits, providing diversified uh, gene pool. And, uh, the most important trait or aspect of the ICR, they are self-sustaining because they can raise their own replacement stock, unlike the improved uh, chicken. Uh, and uh, management requirement is not as such critical as those of uh, commercial chickens. And their product is, uh, is believed to fetch more money than those from exotic uh, breeds. So most of the reports actually uh, appraise all these uh, good uh, Threats of indigenous chicken, uh, but still they have, been, they have reported challenges of IC in uh, East Africa for their growth rates, uh, and they are believed to produce fewer small sized eggs and comparatively little meat. People also uh, keep them without commercial uh, intentions, and they have been neglected actually by breeders and scientists, uh, despite some good characteristics and attributes of the uh, IC. Uh, overall, the poor productivity of birds, a shortage and poor quality of feeds consumed by village chickens, frequent these outbreaks and inappropriate housing uh, are actually being reported as main, con main constraints of the East African IC chicken. The other most important challenge is the gradual erosion of, uh, erosion of the genetic diversity of the stock through uh, crossbreeding and uh, upgrading programs. A case in point is uh, in Tanzania, commercial poultry production is uh, increasing. Uh, and in Kenya, the same is true. Uh, many genetic improvement uh, programs are, have been started through so crossbreeding, as well as uh, just dissemination of improved uh, poultry strains is uh, becoming a very quite uh, common phenomenon. Uh, the same is true for Ethiopia and Uganda. For instance, in uh, Uganda, you can have a number of exotic breeds like Rhode Island, Red Hubbard, Arbor Acres, Ibro, uh, Bovans Brown, Bovans Gold Line, and other strains are being uh, disseminated. So this is actually putting the, the uh, indigenous chicken in uh, danger. Um, Many reports have highlighted the indiscriminate distribution or dissemination of exotic chimp food in East Africa. And uh, several local chickens have been classified into breeds or exotic types, but many remain unidentified and are uh, facing uh, extinction. These are actually the vivid uh, reports from uh, different sources. And uh, there is no structured breeding policies and breeding strategy and breeding program. And, 
uh, the focus for uh, the IC genetic resource is quite uh, limited in these countries. Uh, when it comes to the conservation status of IC in Africa, uh, different literature stated uh, that uh, there has been little effort to conserve the local chicken breeds uh, or lions, and uh, only a few attempts have been uh, done here and there uh, in the uh, east uh, part of the continent. Uh, just to see some breeding programs in the different countries, uh, we have seen in Kenya where we only noted from, a, from the literature, I only noted that there is only one breeding program, which is actually set up in uh, National Research Institute uh, at Naivasha, Nakuru County, County by uh, Gertan University. And uh, it's almost, if I'm not mistaken, about six generation. Uh, and also, uh, actually, this um, breeding program has been started by collecting eggs from the different, like, uh, from different agroecological regions and of uh, Kakamega, Bondo, Naro, West Paco, Omit, and all other uh, some other uh, regions. Uh, when we see the breeding programs programs in Tanzania, I think uh, we have one uh, breeding program which is jointly established by uh, Tanzania Livestock Research Institute and ILRI. Uh, this is actually a selective breeding targeting on Horasi uh, chicken, and uh, it has been initiated in 2018. This is basically located at uh, Taliri Nali Nendle in Matawa region, southern part of uh, San Tanzania. So this is actually the uh, uh, the loop of the or the phenotypic uh, or the morphological aspect of Horasi uh, uh, chicken in Tanzania. Uh, when we come to the breeding programs in Ethiopia, uh, we have two breeding programs running currently. One is the Horo breeding program, which uh, engages or employs Horo uh, chicken uh, ecotype. And this has been exercised by uh, Debrezeit Agricultural Research Center, uh, which is closest to Addis, 45 kilometer. And now the breed improvement is at the stage of 11th generation. The other is the breeding program that targets still the ecotype, which is on northwestern western part of Ethiopia uh, uh, in Amara region. And uh, it's about 22 kilometers from the regional capital, Baharda. So uh, Tilili is an ecotype. It's at second generation. And uh, it is running in my center called Andasa Livestock Research Center. Uh, in association with uh, ILRI, with the support of ILRI. So mm -hmm. this is the ecotype uh, actually uh, under uh, selection at uh, Andasa Livestock Research Center station. This is uh, what the flow we have there. Basically, uh, uh, just to show you my uh, PhD uh, output, uh, this, uh, in my PhD work, we have tried to characterize 27 populations using uh, genome sequencing, called genome sequencing. So this was actually the output from the principal component uh, analysis, which uh, brings the different clusters of from the 27 uh, populations. Uh, breeding pro regarding the breeding programs in Uganda and Mozambique, uh, the report from uh, web showed there is a marker assisted breeding program uh, on map chicken and uh, with the uh, in partnership with the university of uh, eduardo uh, and actually supported by kaima uh, foundation this has been started in 2019 and is actually running by two countries uh, mozambique and uh, uganda and i have seen that uh, it has been also supported by the african union and the european uh, commission commission so uh, most of the literatures emphasize that there is a pressing need for conservation uh, because uh, indigenous chicken are actually heat tolerant and the global temperature is expected to increase. Uh, they do have a very good adaptation to nutrition. Uh, parasite tolerance, disease resistance and uh, tolerance uh, characters of the indigenous chicken is uh, very important. Uh, so, because of the uh, rapidly increasing demand for poultry across East Africa, uh, the contribution of commercial uh, 
chickens is uh, growing. So this means the indigenous chicken will uh, dwindle uh, year by year. So I think there has to be a strategy to uh, conserve this uh, uh, indigenous uh, population. And uh, factors actually show that the majority of poultry genetic resources are uh, maintained uh, in situ in living populations. Uh, but sometimes in situ conservation of poultry genetic resources may not be reliable uh, for the risk of uh, these outbreaks. Uh, so, and also uh, inbreeding as well as uh, uh, crossbreeding with uh, different uh, strains. So, we uh, have to uh, go through different uh, conservation uh, aspects. Uh, basically, people uh, recommend different conservation uh, practices like conservation of uh, in the form of uh, ova or embryo, preservation of genetic information in, uh, in the form of DNA uh, using blood, either in the form of blood, tissue, and uh, DNA, and uh, they advise conservation of live uh, populations. The other one, which is actually an advanced approach, uh, is the biobanking. Uh, uh, which involves the uh, primordial uh, germ cells. So I think this is uh, uh, basically developed by the uh, ILRI and CTJ team in Roslyn. So uh, people are actually advising this technique uh, for uh, reliable conservation of animal uh, genetic uh, resources. So far, uh, few germ lines are uh, being uh, preserved uh, for Tanzania. Uh, Kenya and uh, Ethiopia at, uh, at Ilri uh, Gym Bank in Nairobi. Uh, finally, as a conclusion, uh, extensive, extensive uh, regarding the reports from the uh, literature, we have noted that extensive characterization is not exhaustively uh, done. They are mainly focusing on phenotypic microsatellite and mitochondrial DNA. So in this uh, case, there are many strains that have been uh, un, uh, characterized, uh, except that 27 populations have been characterized by whole genome uh, sequence uh, with the support of uh, CTJ, Lesch, and uh, ILRI. Uh, the other uh, conclusion is high genetic diversity makes the indigenous chicken population uh, suitable for future genetic impact and uh, utilization under a wide uh, range of agroecologists. Uh, people are also advising advanced conservation technique for IC is required, uh, such as biobanking is uh, required. And uh, many people also suggest that just to avoid the uh, to avoid the dilution of the indigenous genetic uh, resource, there is a need to delineate exotic chicken distribution area in uh, East African uh, countries uh, by avoiding the indiscriminate and haphazard uh, dissemination of uh, chicken. Uh, and uh, just noting the literature search, uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, and uh, Tanzania has diverse indigenous chicken uh, genotypes compared to the other uh, East African uh, countries. So this is what I have. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Adebabe, for giving us all these figures and uh, raising the importance of uh, indigenous chicken in the regions per country. And uh, yes, we are there, and uh, exactly CTIGH, Ilri, and their colleagues from Rosna Institute, who have been supporting on the bar banking, will really be interested to continue working with you and ensure that uh, we crop preserve what is the, one of the main assets for the forest family, the forest families in the, in, in the regions. So that is important. Please keep uh, recording, you are keeping your participant. Please keep uh, texting your questions in the Q&A while we are moving to uh, the next presenter, which should be Dr. Sam, Samuel Boku. Sam, are you there? Yes. Sam is muted. Yes. Okay. Yes, Christian. 
Okay, thank you very much, Sam. So Dr. Samuel Boku is a senior researcher and scientist at the Kenya Agricultural Astro Research Organization, CALDO. And uh, he is a quantitative geneticist with many years experience in design and implementation of last genetic program. And he has special focus on indigenous breed and population. And uh, some has also led very well genetic improvement initiative for livestock in the Kenya and in many other countries. And uh, lead, he has led, led so many resource mobilization and research agenda for livestock genetic in East Africa. And he's also involved in a numerous uh, public private partnership for development and upscaling of livestock technologies and innovation. He is a member of many public and private organizations here in Kenya. Mostly, he's the chairman of Animal Production Society of uh, Kenya and vice chairman of the National Advisory Committee for Management of Animal Genetic Resources, and uh, also serve as ex executive committee member of the All African Society of Animal Production. And some is a pure product from the University of Egerton in Kenya. So uh, with that expertise, and uh, he's going to, make, to discuss with us local animal genetic resources in Africa and also their conservation status after poultry. Please, Sam, you have the floor. Thank you, Christian. Am I you sharing or? It. Yes, you are sharing. You can put it on presentation mode. Yes, good. So, um, welcome colleagues. I'm going to take you through this uh, short, very short presentation, looking at the local, uh, you know, ruminant genetic resources uh, in East Africa and talking quick, quickly about their conservation status. Uh, this, I could have done it in uh, maybe two days, but in the 10 minutes, I think I'm going to do my best. But generally looking at the, the, the East African region, you all agree with me that there's great animal agriculture transformation and transition, which is underway. Uh, as predicted globally, Probably a third of the population of farmers will leave farming. A third, they are not sure whether they'll continue or not. And for sure, around a third will continue with farming. It is today that we want, we want to make that decision by supporting them with technologies, policies, markets, and institutions that will help them to transition. And I'm sure through this, we can tap on the 30% who are not sure what to do so that they can, we can have 60% of farmers undertake farming. And this is, of course, driven by uh, the, the, the forces in which includes the demand for these uh, uh, products, especially when you are looking at the meat, milk, eggs in the continent and specifically in sub-Saharan Africa is on the increase and is putting pressure on those uh, production systems. And this, of course, demands to present our farmers, our practitioners with new opportunities that will provide these uh, products and services to sufficient scale. But for this to happen, colleagues, it means there will be sustainable utilization and therefore conservation efforts becomes critical if we want to increase productivity, adaptation, and the resilience of these animals and the production systems. We are looking at a continent with over 150 breeds for, or for the genus type. Of course, it's more than this. But when we look at the East Africa region, we are talking of huge population of cattle, over 128 million cattle, indigenous cattle. We are talking of around over 
210 million sheep and goats population. It's huge. But colleagues, we have not undertaken enough studies, enough work to identify their genetic distinctiveness between these populations and breeds. This is an area which remains largely unknown. And as much as we, we, we want to promote gene banking, we must understand this. We must provide information on these breeds, on this population, so that we are sure of what we are going to put in our gene banks is very critical. And that maybe comes earlier as we engage in conservation efforts. This, if we are not sure, we are going to erode our genetic resources. And this has happened through crossbreeding, systematic breed replacement initiatives, which has happened over the last years. You all agree with me? Farmers, practitioners, even policymakers in the continent have appetite for the exotic breeds but they don't necessarily care about the indigenous breed how they will maintain it as you know we continue with crossbreeding and other you know practices this is something that we need to have a conversation around otherwise we are going to lose our genetic attributes which are very essential for these uh, populations indigenous population when we are looking at the whole issue of challenges like the drought, you know, we are talking about the parasites and so forth. Those challenges are there and we need to maintain our the, 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 the indigenous population which responds well to this. If we, we have to do the crossbreeding, we must have a structured way of doing this. That's the conversation that we should talk and talk and talk about it. We have been talking about it, but it seems that we are not getting it right. We need such forums, talk to our policymakers, talk to our farmers, and show them why we need to do this and this. Having said that, colleagues, um, if you look at uh, the East Africa region, we have a huge population and uh, of, of uh, indigenous cattle breeds. And we have various breeds. Um, if you look like Kenya, we have the Kenyan zebus. We are talking about over 12 ecotypes of the Kenyan zebu spread across the country. But some of these ecotypes, we are losing them rapidly. and. Uh, the animals that we used to produce around eight liters, nine liters uh, of milk per day, they are currently producing around two liters, three liters per day. We are losing that very as a important uh, genetics. And even some of the population of these zebus, um, they, they, they are no longer there. If you look at the Kikuyu zebu and so forth, that's why conservation is very key. And we must talk about holistically and have concerted efforts toward their maintaining these populations. We have the improved Kenyan Boran, you know, developed here in Kenya. These are very important genetic resources and that do very well in our rangelands ecosystems. Of course, we have the Saiwo Kato, which has been developed over the years in Kenya. Um, and it is now a transborder in a, a breed. You know, you find it in Tanzania, you find it in Uganda, find it in Rwanda, and now Congo. Um, the challenge with Saiwo is their population and the, the genetic diversity. Uh, we are current, currently in, in talking to Pakistan. We want to import some more semen so that we can widen up the gene pool and also promote conservation uh, initiatives. Uh, this is a very important, uh, you know, cut of genetic resources that we need to look into so that it's not under threat. And of course, we have a huge 
population of the crossbreds, uh, crossbreds in this country of various shades, especially from indigenous and our the exotic counterparts. Um, so you, the, you, if you see the space is so huge, and uh, this is just some of you know the breeds that are found locally here. At the regional level, of course, looking at uh, the East Africa, we have the Mpop, Tanzania, which has been uh, efforts, I mean, breeding and efforts uh, of the research institute for many years. You know, we have the Ankole in Uganda. Yeah, you know, we have the Suko in Somalia. We have the Creole in Mauritius. If you look at the region, and, and typically we have huge genetic resources and potential of these uh, you know populations uh, of course if you look at the creole in mauritius the, the population is low uh, they have been relying on more on the the, the 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 breed from brazil and it's another area that we need to focus on so that we can see how we can conserve these genetic resources of course we are doing multiplication at scale for the agole uh, you, you talk of Uganda, you talk of Sudan and other uh, South Sudan and other countries. Uh, you find that their population is not really at at risk because of their numbers spread across the region. Um, is huge and as you know, if you go to northern Kenya, you know the Ethiopia, you will find the Borana, millions of eggs. You go to Eritrea, you also the back and the other three genotypes, you know, the Fogera in Ethiopia and the Daura in Somalia, huge, huge, uh, you know, uh, population of uh, uh, cattle breeds. And, you know, if you go to Congo, you see the Lagune, you know, the Butanas, the Kenanas of Sudan, you know, the list is long, colleagues, you know, all the way to Sanga, which is in Burundi, Rwanda, and Congo. Uh, that's why I'll say I will need two days to discuss these animals. You know, they are so huge. But basically what you see from this population, they are not really at risk uh, because uh, we have uh, good numbers. Uh, what we need to focus on is not to lose specific equotypes, which, you know, have important attributes and the characteristics that we need to maintain. Um, so uh, this is where we are in terms of the cattle population um, locally and the huge diversity, I cannot overemphasize on this. But also we have uh, different classes, especially when you are talking about the taurine breeds. Um, we have the Hereford, we have the cement, which have been here in, in the region for long. You know, when you look, talk of the, the black and the red anchors, you know, several beef types and also the dual purpose types which are domiciled in this region and we have used them meant for many years especially in focusing on the on the cross breeding initiatives which has really structured and these animals are now here with us and form part of our population um then uh um, I just wanted to show one slide on the ship as well. Uh, we have, of course, the Dopa ship. We have the, you know, the Red Master ship. And we have the Black Headed Passion ship. Black Headed Passion ship, we have huge ecotypes across, spread across the region. Actually, the main dominant breed. Uh, in, and, you know, I wanted to show it vis-a-vis -vis Dopa. Because so some people don't know the you know the differences, but if you look at the tail of those two breeds, you can see the difference in terms of if you look at the fat. That was strategic for me so that we can all appreciate. So these are also in millions. When you talk of the black and partial ship, may not be under threat, but it's also critical to have them you know we have we talk about the issues of the exit conservation is as well of course the dopa the dopa has been here farmers continue to import uh, genetics from south africa is a conversation that we need to have whether we maintain the population that we have and see how we can sustainably utilize it 
while conserving you know the genetic resources um i have put a red flag on the red masai sheep because again this is a transported breed but it's at risk the population has gone down uh, just recently in Kenya, we were trying to do some work in support of the, um, supported by the AUIBA, what we were calling the homecoming, um, the Red Masai ship. Because basically we had lost this ship, but we went across the country, you know, looking for some remnants of this, and we have started a reconstruction of the breed. Of course, working with our, contact, our colleagues from Tanzania, to see where we can find it and continue to multiply and with continuous selection you know of of the breed that is a red flag and we need to, to some some efforts towards the conservation of this breed of course we have the list is long i did go deep down and we have the men's you know the sudan desert the oro breed you know the rwanda burundi tanzania a long tail ship. So you can see in the region we are rich. The diversity is again very, very, very huge for these sheep genetic resources. Um, colleagues, uh, again, I can talk about the goat and genetic resources, maybe a day or something. Uh, but basically, we have the, the, the gala goats. Gala goats are widespread, you know, the Somali goat, you know, in uh, Eastern Africa. And we have a huge population uh, of these uh, genetic resources. Uh, so we can say that we need to continue maintaining the in-situ conservation efforts, but as well, we need also to look at the executive conservation efforts uh, in an ongoing basis. The small East African goat, uh, so much widespread again across the region. And um, again, we need to promote utilization and sustainable conservation and sustainable utilization and conservation of the genetic resources. We have the short, you know, we had Somali goat, we have the Sudanese goat, Congo dolphin, you know, the Kigezi, the Tanzania, and so forth, the Nubian, huge diversity of the genetic resources. What we may need to do is to look at the structured breeding programs and the conservation initiatives so that we maintain these genetic resources for now and the future use. Otherwise, thank you for listening. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much, Sam for giving us that uh, deep thought on the animal genetic resources, small ruminant in East Africa. And uh, we can see the great diversity and show most of the participants here, some of them should be very interested to come closer to you to see what can be done on the ground. And uh, same as uh, Richard, I also agree with you that when we are pushing with the regional agendas, we also need to ensure that the national, at the national level, the conservation strategies are in place to really add value to these genetic resources, preserve them for future generations. Thank you very much, Sam. And uh, please keep typing your questions. Then we move to the next presenter, uh, Professor Donald. Ugoza. Donald, can you hear us? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, uh, Professor Kugonza is a passionate, anim a passionate animal scientist and uh, associate professor at the University of Makerere, where he's really focusing on optimizing agricultural productivity through performance improvement of a wide array of several animal genetic resources. He's also a professor of bioscience at the uh, Chandigarh University in India, and he coordinated the service learning internship program, a 15 years collaboration between McLeary and uh, Iowa State University in the USA. So his major interest is also 
uh, conservation and performance improvement in the African animal genetic resources. And uh, on that perspective, he's serving in many organizations, many platforms, and uh, uh, collaboration with many partners within and uh, across uh, and outside Africa. So Prof. Uh, Donald is going to write on the local pig genetic resources in East Africa and their conservation status before we move to uh, other questions. Please, Prof, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you so much, Chair. Uh, Dr. Christian, thank you so much. Uh, kindly uh, support with the access to the, the sharing. So can you see my screen? Hello? I can yet see it. I think there is an issue. Um, how do we Maybe proceed? you can stop. You can stop sharing and uh, proceed start again. again. Okay. Start again. Uh, okay. What about now? It's coming. Are you? Can you see it now? Uh, no. I'm not yet seeing it, but uh, I don't no, know if others are seeing. It's still loading. It's not it's loading. It's still loading. Can you can you put the because it was sharing last time? Can you just put the PowerPoint on because I could see okay. your screen, but it, yeah, so. Like yeah. I go out of uh, presentation mode? No, no, I can see your screen. Can you go to the next slide? Okay. Yeah, okay, yes. that's fine. Good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, colleagues. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Donald Kugons has uh, been introduced is my name. And uh, I'm glad to be talking today about uh, local pig genetic resources in East Africa and their conservation status. Um, this presentation is made with kindness of uh, our colleagues in the region. I would like to recognize uh, some colleagues from uh, Sudan, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Kenya, and especially in a Greek in Uganda. So I come from Makerere, as you've heard. Uh, we just celebrated 100 years, uh, and uh, uh, that's one of the things we are doing in uh, trying to preserve our environment is using electric uh, means to power our transport. So I'm talking about POC this evening uh, and uh, a very nice subject because I'm sure many people in the room actually enjoy this product. Kindly join us later this year, we shall be resuming the POC Expo that has become part of the national calendar where all tribes of pork are enjoyed. Stay tuned, I think around September, October, we shall be inviting you. So uh, as a starting point, um, the pig is actually an orphaned animal. So you won't hear a very nice story uh, from me um, that uh, this graph, which I think is part of uh, uh, what um, Mary, Dr. Mary presented, actually shows the focus on the pig in Africa. And you can see that um, though Africa didn't have a domestication point for pigs, we do have a lot of pigs of interest. Unfortunately, our governments have not paid um, the best service to them in comparison to other species. And uh, thank you so much for organizing this seminar because it also helps to air the concerns about this animal. So in terms of distribution, uh, Dr. Mary showed this graph, but I bring it back because my interest was to show that actually the pig is actually, uh, in terms of breeds, it is the least, 
there are very few breeds. And uh, when you come to East Africa, actually we are doing worst. So this graph here shows the distribution of breeds uh, in Africa. And if you look at pigs, and you look at actually the, the, the yellow line, it actually shows the pigs. So we, we are doing badly already in terms of numbers, but then coupled with the, the focus on uh, research, conservation, and actually promoting uh, utilization of the local pigs uh, kind of makes it worse. Uh, so within East Africa, um, I was interested to look at the, the breeds and how they are distributed. So you'll find that, um, again, I, I maintain on the other species. Uh, you'll see that uh, on the pigs where I'm putting the red line, uh, we just have so little. I think it's only Rwanda and Kenya, uh, Uganda and Tanzania. The others have actually not even declared whether they have um, uh, particular breeds. So the, 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 I, the, that's part of what I'm saying. You know, information is not coming through. So we don't know much of the status of the pigs that we have. In terms of production system, uh, there are four main production systems. Uh, we have the free range system uh, where the, the pigs just walk all over. And as I will be telling you, uh, this has been one of the major ways how the African swine fever, uh, which probably should change a name now that has gone almost uh, global. It is in Asia, it is in Europe, um, is concerned. So the free range system is a dominant system, probably handling about half, if not 60% of all the pigs in the region, the East African region. Uh, we have um, a smaller proportion of people who are able to tether their pigs. So they are still exposed to all kinds of environments, but at least they're in one place, the tethering system. Then we have the semi-intensive. Uh, some people have argued that actually there is no, it's the semi-intensive, they're in permanent houses and they stay in. But as I will show you in a while, most of the people actually who use this system release their sows once or twice a year. And that to me qualifies them as semi-intensive because then in the time when they're out of the house, then they are exposed to all kinds of challenges, especially disease. And then we have what uh, some people prefer to call the industrial system, the intensive, the true intensive system where the animals actually stay inside for their entire life. So uh, it is within these four that most of our pig farmers actually playing. This is the playing field. And um, as I said, uh, I think the last two contribute less than 20%, if not five in East Africa. So uh, when Mr. Chairman and team you asked me to look at this subject, I decided to approach it from country level because there is a lot of uniqueness in our region. It would actually be unfair to bulk everybody up, uh, but I will be brief. And in a way uh, for different countries, I look at different things. So I started in Burundi and uh, partly because we had the chance to engage uh, with government uh, on their national uh, strategy of breeding uh, just last year. So Burundi, the pig size is actually unknown. <laughs> Even at the point of reporting, we actually couldn't agree on one figure to put in. I hope Dr. Charles Lagu is not in the room. But at least we did say they could be somewhere around 450,000, uh, though that figure is actually not in the reports. So overwhelmingly, the pigs in Burundi are local and uh, they do have some imported breeds, the large whites, the Pietran. And here I want to recognize Ilri, who has supported the introduction of Duroc. Actually, the Duroc you see in the photograph is from their uh, research station in Mahua. It's one of the sows at Mahua. Uh, then um, also to mention, they have a very big uh, market that is a pulling factor from DRC. 
that's the Democratic Republic of Congo. But one of the major things which you hear in all the regions of Burundi, whether it's in a row in the north, in Chivitoke, or in the south, in the east, in, in, in Karusi, people are complaining about the law on zero grazing. It's not just the, the ruminant keepers who are complaining. It is also the pig farmers. That tells you uh, the farmers interest in terms of production scale. They still want to zero, uh, rather free range their pigs, but now it's actually not possible. And that might actually mean the disappearance of the local pig in that country. So there is a photograph there, which I just asked Mr. Google, tell me uh, the, pig, the pigs in Burundi. I did the same for Rwanda, uh, and, and that's the picture you can see. So Rwanda has uh, slightly more pigs, at least the documented 1.8 million pigs. Uh, this is obviously a, a drop in the ocean. If you look at the world population of pigs, 678 million, you know, and uh, most of the pigs in Rwanda are kept by smallholders, you know, one to two, three sows. And uh, very interestingly in Rwanda, 80%, if not more, of the households actually rear pigs, also of the farming households. So the pig is almost as dominant in households as a chicken. And that comes with its problems as well as advantages, okay? So I'm just showing you here um, from this recent works uh, on the challenges and opportunities in Rwanda, where they, they are trying to assess some of the you know, productivity parameters. And I'm just, I just want to pick out one or two things. Okay, so this slide actually shows you in the Eastern province. This is the province which has the best performance of pigs. Okay, so you look at things like, um, number of piglets born per liter, seven piglets. And yet we know you need at least five piglets to meet the cost of looking after the sow. If you also have a boar, you actually need six and a half, which actually, if you, this figure means people actually not making any money hmm, from rearing pigs, okay? Obviously, many times they are not uh, costing their labor, they're not costing uh, many things. So the productivity is not good. And I will not give you figures for the East African countries because they're not very different. If you look at the birth weight, 1.9 kilograms, that is partly responsible for the high mortality rates that we see in East Africa of the pigs. So I will uh, leave that. Uh, when you go to Southern Sudan, uh, this is uh, uh, not good, uh, that we don't have statistics, okay? But we have this information that most of the pork is actually imported from Western Nile in Uganda. Uh, most of the pigs there are local. Now, when you ask uh, for the pictures of pigs in Sudan, actually you also get some human beings. Uh, you just check your Google where you are seated there, okay? So uh, we, a lot needs to be done. Uh, we need to support and uh, uh, get uh, that region to produce more pork. Obviously it is uh, good that they're importing a lot of pork from Northern Uganda. There is one uh, farmer called Santa Clara in uh, West Nile who actually told me she sells about 500 kgs per week to Sudan. Okay, so there is a pull factor also from that direction. In Tanzania, they have 1.6 million pigs. And then when you come to Uganda and Kenya, then you have the numbers going up. So Uganda has about 5 million pigs, Kenya has about 3 million pigs. Uganda slot has about 1 million pigs per year, Kenya about half a million pigs. Ugandans consume 3.5 kilograms of pork per year. Ugandans, or rather Kenyans, are doing 400 grams per year. Now, I have these three graphs to show you, or to show us that we may be producing pork, but actually a lot of pork is being imported. If you look here, these are metric tons of pork, or 
other forms of, um, of, of pig meat, sausages and others, hmm? bacon. And these figures are huge. Look, you're looking at uh, Kenya is importing, uh, Uganda is importing, Rwanda is importing. Some of the products in Rwanda come from as far as France up to today. Okay, some of the, of the products in Uganda. So this graph is actually a Ugandan map, a Ugandan graph, though I'm talking about those other countries. Okay, you also see that though Uganda is importing, it actually is exporting. But obviously most of the pork, as you can see, is actually going to DRC. Mm -hmm. I think DRC is probably 98% of what Uganda sells to the world. Mm -hmm. The two bars uh, you see there, uh, actually, uh, one is wild, the blue bar is wild, and the yellow bar is, is DRC. Uh, also, interestingly, Uganda has been importing uh, quite a lot of uh, purebred pigs, okay? And the aim has been really to boost the, the quality genetics of pigs. You know, 2017, almost 9,000 uh, um, metric tons. Uh, of pigs are coming in. Uh, this is metric tons of live pigs eh, for breeding. Uh, we are reporting them in terms of weight. Uh, 2018, uh, almost uh, 6,500, almost 6,800. Now, the danger here is a lot of serious breeders have established in Uganda. I'll show you a map. But most of these people are actually losing their pigs. Hmm? I think the most recent uh, 2022, uh, there was a farm with 5,000 pigs. Uh, it just ended with zero. They just died out. There's one farmer in Kamuli, um, uh, JB Farms, had 3,500 pigs, uh, runs an abattoir which slaughters um, 100 pigs per day. And of those 100, 70 are from his farm. He's no longer slaughtering from his farm because he was hit. Now, I'm showing you here um, a graph. I, I hope it can be seen. Uh, this is the Nairobi pig value chain. The picture I want to show here is that there are so many actors in the pig value chain uh, that it gets muddled. Uh, it's good that there are many people who are taking a cut, but the danger is that then you have uh, not an organized system. This picture is typical for East Africa. I mean. Uh, if you look at the value chain mapping in Uganda, in Rwanda, they have been done. The picture is actually not different. Okay. Uh, part of the picture I'm also drawing is that there is ongoing research. So I will not have separate presentation on uh, extent of research. I'll, I think talk about conservation. So research on pigs is ongoing. But you could actually say, I mean, support me, hopefully that most of these efforts are not national efforts and a lot can be done, okay? Uh, so now I want to go to the pigs. What type of pigs actually kept? So I start here with this uh, a slide, which shows us some of the wild uh, suid populations. And uh, of interest should be what we are calling the local breeds. So you see there what we call the local black pigs, the spotted pig, the local belted pig. So these pigs are considered local breeds in much of these African countries, but actually they have a very strong association with introduced exotic breeds. At least a recent study, I will just show a study which showed that most of these breeds are actually based on either the large black, these are what you call the old European breeds, the large black, the saddleback, Hampshire, you know, those are the breeds which were introduced in East Africa and they have actually been localized. So when you see them weighing 30 kilograms, 40 kilograms uh, towards maturity, uh, it doesn't really make them indigenous in any way. Uh, so good, we call them local uh, because they have been indigenized and we should actually uh, find ways of conserving them because there are all reports now showing that these are more resilient in our production systems, okay? So uh, if we go to the, what you call the introduced breeds, the recent introduced breeds, we have the Cambras, uh, which 
uh, from our work shows that uh, it produces the best pork. At least the eaters say that the test panels did say cambras produce the best pork. And that's because the cambra is actually a, a, a composite, okay, of large white, landrace, and duroc. Uh, there is the large whites, which make very good mothers. Uh, there is the duroc, which is now a major breed in the region. I think in the last five years, um, all the countries of the region have introduced, introduced it. And then uh, for Uganda, we captured what they call the Nagrik pig. It's actually a three-way cross uh, with the same composition or with the same uh, breed uh, um, makeup as the Cambra. Then the other uh, breeds in the region are uh, really breeds which have been introduced from South Africa and Denmark. They are still breeds which are based on the large white, the land race, and the duroc, plus some of the earlier, what you call the earlier European breeds. So you can see like here, the 327, um, PIC 327, uh, PIC 800, which looks like uh, purely like a duroc. I mean, uh, you can't tell them, you can't tell between them. Just like the 327 looks like the saddleback. Then you have the PIC 408, which I preferred to, uh, to put together with the Petran. A Petran initially was a very popular breed in, in Central Africa, Rwanda, Burundi, but now it is popularized in Uganda and Kenya. So it is um, uh, typically pork, a pork animal. Um, I know in some of the places, I think when you, uh, from the reports, there are problems with some of the pork markets because of the, the kind of appearance of the carcasses. Otherwise, the, the sizes are accepted. And then uh, obviously there is the uh, black belt, uh, 5359. These are commercial lines, but which you can clearly subscribe to the foundation breeds. They are, to me, they are selections from the mainstream lines or the foundation lines, uh, but you may not really quote me on that. That is my opinion. Uh, there is the Danish land race. And then there are these uh, uh, black pigs which are breeding true in East Africa, purely 100% black. And um, we can't really uh, subscribe them to any particular breed. And so we need to do work on them. Uh, you can see on the right uh, that black sow after insemination with the uh, large white semen it produced its litter 100 percent white so there's a lot uh, to discover about our pigs um, this is a, a shot from brian's work this is a recent work uh, where they were uh, ilri was looking at um, the genetic composition of um, the breeds of pigs in, uh, in Uganda. And they found uh, the, the very interesting story, which I just mentioned about uh, this association with the old British breeds and the modern breeds like the land race, the Danish uh, land race, and the Cambra. Uh, this is a shot from uh, my colleague Robert. Uh, he's actually collecting semen. And I wanted to show this because the black pig, uh, though farmers say they love this pig, when it comes to ordering semen for insemination, the number is so small. It's almost like 2%. percent Of all the doses of semen, I want to say that the black pigs actually make very good teasers. So they will just stand and enable you to uh, collect uh, the, the semen. Great, so this map uh, shows, um, is a map of Uganda, it shows where farmers are adopting the use of artificial insemination. Uh, I, I would say that uh, a part of the semen actually from Uganda uh, goes up to DRC, goes to Rwanda, and I think there have been some doses which have gone to Western Kenya. So 
uh, the, I, the issue here is farmers love the local pigs, but when they go into improvement, nobody is thinking about the black pig. Very few, if at all, are ordering a black male uh, or, or semen from a black male. They are all asking for Duroc, they are asking for Pietran, they are asking for large white Cambra. Therefore, for the sake of conservation of the local pig that is now indigenized, uh, we need to do something. I'm showing this photograph. It shows one young man, Eric, who has said he has inseminated the one million pigs. But I think he said that recently. But I mean, I put him at five inseminations per day for the last eight years. That only makes him have insem having inseminated 30,000 times, not a million times. So that is um, uh, part of the situation that we have uh, in the region. So I would say that uh, there is poor access to good quality pig genetics, and that is uh, continues to be a challenge that limits productivity. I've already mentioned the farmers a desire in improving their pigs, but that may raise issues with the conservation of what we have as the localized, you know, the pigs which have been rearing for over 300, 400, 500 years. Uh, obviously, most of the farmers don't keep males, uh, boars. So then they have this temptation of using a communal boar, and then they are always having this problem of swine fever outbreak, okay? Uh, and so that is a challenge, okay? Uh, and so we need solutions here. And um, I, I hope this program uh, that is looking at uh, biobanking is going to, to help uh, because of the likely erosion of the few. You know, if you remember the slides I showed about the number of breeds in the region. Um, uh, the, then uh, one of the things I also want to mention, uh, members and colleagues, is that um, the price of pork has actually been uh, rising in the region. Um, I just mentioned here about Kampala, but it's the same in, in Kenya, it is the same in, in Rwanda and Burundi, you know. So this demand, increased demand for pork is actually a, a, a big issue. And I think um, uh, breeding, and I'm talking about organized, you know, um, recording and evaluations I need to be done. Obviously, importing pigs, you saw we are importing pigs in East Africa, but the cost is very high. So we really need to have uh, mainstream um, breeding programs. I think uh, the picture I get from listening to uh, Dr. Mbuku is very nice, you know, to show uh, what is being done with the ruminants. These are deliberate efforts. And my prayer is that probably after today, uh, we pay more attention as governments to, to the effort of breeding uh, pigs. So this map shows some of the pig breeders um, we have in, in Uganda. And you can see the picture I want to show is that they are all concentrated in the central region. And so when swine fever actually hits, you hear somebody has lost 3,000, the other breed has lost 5,000, the other breed has lost 2,500. You know, it is that worrying. So I'm not sure who has to take the gospel that you can actually take your pig breeding facility 500 kilometers, 300 kilometers out of the center. Obviously the attraction is to be in the center because that's where the biggest uh, demand is. But then the losses that are coming uh, with, the, with, the, with the disease outbreaks is a worrying situation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, my perception is if somebody actually walks in here with uh, a, a vaccine for swine fever, they are going to solve the biggest problem. So my wish uh, or our wish for the East African pig industry uh, is that this industry needs to be more competitive if it's to be sustainable. So whereas I'm actually campaigning for uh, the conservation of the local pigs, uh, we need to put a price tag Obviously, most of the people, when they look at the local pigs, they're looking at them uh, for resilience to disease, okay? Uh, but the, the, the issue about production 
is, is a concern. And I already alluded to that. So genetic improvement uh, needs to, to focus on um, two things. So the market, you can use the superior introduced, okay? But then um, we need to put a price to the local so that they can also compete. Uh, obviously the introduced breeds, as I've already mentioned, they do very well until disease comes and then uh, the loss is coming. So performance should be aligned to the need of the African producers, at least the East African producers and consumers, okay? I'm showing this, uh, uh, this map of East Africa uh, showing the, the different um, outbreaks of um, African swine fever. So the picture is, there are so many viruses. Uh, Mr. Chairman and colleagues, there are over 40 publications on African swine fever in East Africa. It is it is unprecedented that a lot of attention is looking at the outbreaks and uh, sorry Donald can I just interrupt if you don't mind yes uh, are you about to finish in uh, yes I am five minutes yes so these are my last two slides so are we conserving East African local pig resources Mr Chairman I I when I sent you the presentation I said no. But since then, I've actually changed my mind. Um, yes, we actually have some efforts, but maybe they are not formalized. So farmers are conserving in situ, but are shifting gears. Um, I think from my survey, it's only RAB which has an organized program. There are active conservation programs in the East African region, not really quite. Naro Uganda is planning to establish an ex situ in vivo scheme, and Greek as well. And Greek also houses the East African Regional Gene Bank, uh, the, uh, the African Center of Excellence that Mary talked about. In Makerere, we are doing ex situ in vivo with the farmers. But I will say these are not really organized schemes. So that's why I sustained that no up there. Taliri, Nike, Kagrik, Izabu. When I raised this question, I didn't get a comment, and there is even no literature on this. So I can as well say, no, nothing is going on. Is there ongoing research on characterization? Yes, in all the countries, as I've already said. Is there storage or biobanking of pig genetic resources? No. Uh, the main problem with this is that uh, pig semen uh, has issues with cryobanking. Okay. In fact, 99% of, of the pig inseminations use fresh semen. So there are issues there. And therefore, the question is stem cell storage, the future or the next best option? I think so. So I say sure deal, bring it on. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Sorry if I've taken much longer. I'm very grateful to you all for listening to me and to Chandiga University, where I'm calling from in Punjab. Uh, to participate in this seminar. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Rigira Kwanza, for your wonderful presentation. And uh, as Musa, I'm proposing uh, to, because we have already over the time, can we move to directly to the next presenters and uh, have the take the last questions at the end? I think so. Hello, are you getting me? Hello. I yes. can't share I can't share my slides. Yeah, please, because uh, please, Dr. Donald. Donald, can you stop sharing your screen? Oh please. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So can you Thank hear you. me? So, yes. Yeah. Okay. So June is our next presenter. And uh, he's, uh, Dr. Juni is a research scientist at Roslyn Institute at the University of Edinburgh, where he, he obtained his PhD from the, uh, and he has, in, he, where he obtained his PhD and he has both knowledge and the research experience in avian immunology and biology. And he's specialized in biobanking of avian species using primordial gem cells. And in fact, it is, 
his lab with uh, Professor uh, Mike Magru, uh, the one who established this protocol of biobanking that we are exploring using the PGC and development of the surrogate host. This is a technology that we need to transfer not only to poultry, but to other livestock genetic resources to ensure sustainability and large scale disseminations of locally adapted prey to cope with some of the challenges that Professor Donna just mentioned. So, um, John is going to present to us in the few minutes the potential of chromatogen cells and the surrogate host technology for conservation and restoration of animal genetic resources. Please, John, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much for organizing, uh, inviting me to give the presentation uh, in the East African region. So my talk is about to, uh, about the, the biobanking, the avian species, the new method about that. So, so the car preservation of the avian species is highly demanded because they have several uh, end users, including commercial breeders, and also need to uh, preserve the local uh, chicken breed. And also hundreds of the research lines in the research facility need to uh, preserve, uh, preserve the chicken, a valuable chicken lines as well. So we hope based on the, uh, the, the knowledge and the skills we learn from the crop preservation, the chickens will extend this knowledge and uh, techniques to the wild birds because yeah, most of the birds are in danger. So at the moment, the popular and the easy way to uh, a conservation of the chicken breeds, they just uh, keep the livestock. So it keeps the livestock because freeze down the eggs is very difficult. It's so big, it's difficult. Freeze down the semen samples for a short while is okay but for a long term, it's still the problematic. So we can see uh, this is a picture that before the uh, freezing, we can see the semen samples. They have few dead cells labeled here in red. However, after freezing, we saw the semen samples. We see more dead cells appear in the semen samples. So that's a uh, freezing process damage the semen uh, sperms. So here show one experiment. We try to freeze down dozens of the uh, in Berlin uh, at the Roslyn uh, chicken facility. We can see here uh, after freezing so cycle, we can see some uh, some line have a good fertility reach to fifty percent. Some is very but some is very low five to six percent, even lower to zero percent. It's never get, if we freeze down the semen, we may never get this line back. Another problem is if we use a, a frozen semen to bring back the uh, chicken breed, that may need 10 generations to uh, bring, uh, bring a pure line, 99 percent of the uh, pure uh, chicken line. That almost take five years. So the crop preservation of the uh, gonado, uh, uh, primordial germ cells is a new method for the biobacking avian species. So what is a uh, uh, primordial germ cells? Primordial germ cells is a germ, uh, pro, uh, progenitor cells they will develop into the eggs in female and uh, develop into sperm in the male. So in the chicken, when the uh, uh, fresh, uh, fertile eggs just lay, the PGCs present in the uh, what's a blastoderm already, a blaster disc already. When the embryo developed, so the PGCs is migrate. So they first they migrate to the uh, germinal crescent. Here, this is a picture shows um, uh, germ cells. That is uh, from a uh, PGC uh, reporter uh, transgenic embryo. We can see here GFP labeled PGCs. They concentrate as a germinal crescent uh, region. So, and then when the blood system is formed and the PGC enters the blood uh, system, 
and uh, migrate along the blood circulation. Uh, sorry, uh, no, how to, oh, sorry. I want to show them. Here is a movie, we can see the cells uh, migrate uh, inside the blood system. So that is a green uh, PGC, so is migrate along the uh, blood circulation. And then eventually they will reach to their destination, gonad, and then the home there, and then they uh, proliferate, expanding the cell number. We can see when the uh, embryo grow older, the here is a day five and day seven, we can see more green cells uh, expanded, the number is grows. So the currently uh, uh, gets the uh, chicken PGC is a common method is uh, from a blaster disc or from the circulation, uh, circulating blood. The question, the problem is uh, the material from these uh, tissues the cell number is very low. So we have to expand the cell number and grow them in a defined medium. And then when the cell number reach to uh, expect the number and then we can freeze down the cells. And then we, when we want to bring back, bring back the frozen uh, chicken line, and then we can inject the cells into a sterile host. This is a sterile host because they are, uh, we call that the sterile host because they are, Indigenous uh, PGCs are ab ab uh, ablated. So the offspring from them, there will be 100% from the donor cells. Uh, however, because this method needs culture the cells, so that needs a, a defined medium. So that will bring up the cost. And also you need a facility to culture the cells and also you might uh, introduce a, a genetic mutation. So as I mentioned earlier, we want to find a, a easy way to car preserve the chickens. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, older embryos, their gonads uh, has a 10,000 PGCs already. If we just uh, direct freeze down this uh, gonad tissue, so that will be uh, easy and uh, low cost uh, techniques. And then because we didn't culture, so that's the uh, genetic mutation will be low. And also we can mix multiple genotype uh, tissue in one crowd tube. And then that will be increases uh, the genotype in the crowd tubes. And when, one, uh, when we want to bring back the, the frozen uh, chicken line, and the same way we inject the cells into the star host and I will give more details later, and then we will get the offspring. So this is our strategy in details. So we use the uh, GF, uh, GFP or RFP transgenic uh, embryos because there is a ubiquitous express the GFP and the RFP in every cell types. So we choose the embryo uh, at Day, uh, day nine at day nine, because at this stage, the embryo sex can be different, uh, differentiated by the um, uh, gonad morphology. So we can dissect each sex of the gonad and then pull them into uh, separate tubes. And here we freeze down five GFPs plus one RFP. We want to try to see whether or not these uh, low abundant RFP cells will transmit to their offspring. And then next, we want to, we need to demonstrate whether or not we can bring back the frozen, uh, frozen chicken breed uh, from these uh, frozen tissues. So for the male cells, for the male tissues, we just uh, dissociate the cells and then directly inject into the uh, surrogate sterile surrogate host, as I mentioned earlier, as uh, day 2.5. And for the female cells before injection, we purify the germ cells by the max sorting method. And after injection, we seal the window and then leave the embryo for several days, uh, incubate the em uh, embryo for several days. And then we check the, the gonad to see the donor cells colonization is a surrogate host. 
once we happy with all of the conditions and then we hatch the injected injected embryos and then we risk the uh, uh, hatching until the sex mature and then breed them and then we see their offspring by the colors either red colors or green colors to uh, estimate the the, the uh, germline transmission from the donor cells uh, here I show the videos about the techniques, the micro injection techniques. So we inject the uh, donor cells through the, uh, uh, what's that, the uh, dorsal aorta. And then uh, the, the, this embryo is about 2.5 uh, uh, day old. And then we add the, the uh, blue colors into the cell suspension, just indicate is that good or bad injection because bad injection maybe have a leak, uh, will uh, cause a leak. So the injection techniques is very important because that will cause the cells um, uh, uh, embryos uh, variability and also the hatchability. So next, I just uh, focus. Uh, this slide show our sterile host. So our sterile host we use the uh, ICAT based uh, transgenic uh, embryos. So in this. Uh, and in this embryo, transgenic embryos, so we put the uh, uh, inducible chemicals into the embryo, so the endogenous PGC will be uh, induced apoptosis. They eventually will die off, and then we can see here this is the original embryo without drug treatment, uh, without chemical uh, treatment. So here it shows the uh, uh, embryos we put the drug, so the the, the chemical completely killed endogenous PGC. So, and then uh, this slide we need to check. It shows the donor cell colonized into the uh, sterile host. So, because we inject into uh, we inject the GIP and RP cells. So, we, here we can see the RP and the RP in red, uh, RP in red, and GIP in green. The cells. Uh, colonize and grow and survive very well in the uh, in the uh, host uh, in the surrogate host this this picture shows uh, male cells inside of the male uh, gonad and uh, this uh, slide sh uh, this picture shows uh, uh, female cells inside of the females so we can see the low abundant rfp still survive and present and grow very well in the uh, surrogate host so next, we need to uh, demonstrate the, whether or not the donor cells from the frozen tissues, they can transmit to the offspring. So I did the uh, four separate injections. So including two male tissues and two female tissues. They all uh, in the cold storage uh, about three months or over three months. So as I mentioned earlier, for the males, I didn't do the max sorting, just direct inject the so cells in the surrogate host. For the female, before the injection, purify the cells. Here shows the cell numbers. For the male cells, I inject about 50 to 60,000 cells. For the females, inject uh, 1,000 and uh, 1,500 cells. So here shows the... Uh, uh, the variability of the injected embryos is very, uh, very good. It's over 60%. We are happy with the results. So the hatchability, except this first one, as uh, the hatchability was very low, just uh, 40%. And then we improved the incubation conditions. And then the hatchability increased dramatically is over 70%. That looked very good. And then we uh, grow the hatchlings until the sex mature, and then we uh, breed them. And then we breed the, the, the uh, uh, founders, male founders, of course with the uh, female founders. So by this way, we will uh, direct to produce a pure offspring from this breeding uh, program. So here show some, uh, uh, some data from the breeding pens. You can see one, um, 
female breeding pens, uh, the egg productivity is 6.3 per hen per week. Another is five. Uh, maximum, they are seven, uh, seven eggs per hen per, 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 per week. So this uh, number is very close to their original, uh, original breed. So, and also we check the uh, embryo's fertility. We can see as very good. One pen is 80%, another is 90, 98%. We didn't see any uh, leakage from endogenous uh, PGCs. So, and then we also had hatched one batch of the eggs. We hatched uh, 60 eggs. And then the, that X 90% fertility and the hatchability is 91%. Again, we didn't see any uh, leakage from the endogenous PGCs. So here just uh, shows the uh, offsprings. This is embryo, green, uh, red, green, and yellow. Yellow means uh, the uh, uh, genes come from both parents and the hatchlings are very healthy, we can see here. So use this method, we also check, uh, we also test on the two different uh, research line, including uh, inbred line N and also crossbred uh, like Sussex. Here is the, this is uh, chickens, here is uh, uh, surrogate parents. Uh, they are the brown uh, feather colored. So their offspring is the uh, white feather colored. It look very similar to their uh, natural uh, sister and brothers. They are also white feathers. Here is La Sussex, their parents, uh, surrogate parents is brown color, uh, feather color. And La Sussex, La Sussex uh, offspring is, uh, is uh, the, the, they have the neck feather pattern is blue, is very unique. They are look very similar to their natural brother and sister from the natural parents. So use this method, we start to uh, car preserve the Rosling research lines, including line, Imbra lines, and La Sussex, Rhode Island Red, and G line, and also other research transgenic chicken line. So our story have we uh, reported in the uh, poultry world, and also our data published in the eLife, if you're interested and you can uh, uh, go back to, 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 to see this. Uh, papers. My last slide, I just want to thank his, uh, thanks all of the people listed here, and especially Sanyu and Mike, they teach me a lot of the techniques. So, and uh, I also want to thank all the uh, founders, including the CT, uh, CTLGH, so they initiate this study at the beginning, and currently I support by the NC3Rs. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Jun, for the wonderful presentation when well operated. And um, yes, uh, we I think many people will have questions. Of course, we should record them, and we should be able to go back to you. But this is what we really need to extend to East Africa and ensure that we conserve uh, genetic resources from. Uh, um, from the regions and uh, repopulate what is almost uh, missing now. So um, normally we have uh, uh, Tom, Tom Dodon, who is supposed to be the next presenter, but uh, he's uh, missed his fly yesterday from the US to UK. So he's uh, traveling by now, but he shared his presentation, which is not so long, let me allow Allow me to share it with you. Then uh, we go through it together. Can you see it? On my side, not yet. Can you see the slide? No. Yeah. Is visible now, Christian. Your slide is visible, Christian. Just go ahead. 
Are you getting it? Yeah. Are you okay, Christian? I think the the slides are being shared without audio, so many people are asking if they should be hearing something or not. I think Kristen is just playing oh. the slides. Sorry, you can't hear the audio. No, there is no audio. It's just slides uh, streaming one after another. I Okay, maybe we can move to the next presenter when we are fixing these problems. Yeah. Uh, I think it's possible. And uh, this is why we we'll request uh, Effie to come on board to present about the genetic, the compliance at Ulrich. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Yeah, good evening, Mephi, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for all your support to what scientists from Illinois and CTAGS have been doing. Just to introduce you, Mephi is an experience ahead uh, of overall responsibility of, for research compliance and environment, health and safety at the Illinois and he has very strong, uh, long history of working in the research industry as well, including uh, vaccine epidemiology, molecular biology, biotechnology, and cell culture. And uh, Effie is a strong community and social service professional with her master of science focus on, focusing on the occupational health and safety from uh, Jumu Kenya University. And she's a member of many professional associations with regard to compliance and supporting science development uh, for uh, many researchers across all the countries where Ilori has been working. Please, uh, Effie, you shared your presentation, you go ahead. 
and uh, just instruct on about the compliance at Mary. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone and good evening. It's nice listening to all your presentation. This evening, it helps us from the compliance point of view to understand the science so that we are able to support on the compliance. And I just want to quickly take you through the compliance uh, process from listening to the presentations that have been made this uh, after, uh, from uh, this afternoon, I could see that uh, there is quite a bit of the CBD, that is the Convention of Biological Diversity uh, areas of compliance that may come into your, your research that uh, you may need to be aware of. And CBD is, is uh, divided into two protocols, and that is the Cartagena Protocol and the Nagoya uh, protocol. Cartagena deals with the genetically modified organisms and uh, Nagoya deals mainly with access and benefit sharing of genetic resources. So as I talk about it, you'll hear me talk about both of those areas, but most of you will be in the area of the Nagoya protocol, that is access and benefit uh, sharing. But the reason why I've made the presentation on compliance is sometimes we focus only on one area and we forget that compliance is just not one area. Compliance involves a whole range of other things on doing good science that makes you compliant. So to go through uh, your research in a compliant manner, you have to start from internal, and that is your own institution. As many of you are partners at ILRI, I will share the ILRI compliance process. So internally at ILRI, we have our research pillars, which are the research compliance committees. And we have mainly three committees. We have the ethics, we have the animal care and use, and we have the uh, biosafety, biosecurity, the one that takes care of laboratory safety. And then we have the external process, which will involve uh, government uh, agencies. And it's good to note that before you go anywhere, you have to start from within your organization. So internally, what is required of you? In most cases, if you're doing work that involves research, you will need to have what we call uh, ethical approval of your research, just uh, your, your research going through scientific review. And once the scientific review is done and it's been given clearance, then it will go through the ethics review, which is the human ethics, the ERIC, and then we go through ICOOC, that is for the animal ethics and welfare, and then we go through the IBC, that is biosafety and biosecurity. Some projects may only go through uh, human uh, ethics if they just have, they just uh, doing questionnaires for people, and some may just go through animal ethics, but uh, many of them will go through all the three compliance uh, committees. So the external process, so you start from your own internal process, because when you go to the regulators in country where you carry your project, they will actually ask you the internal process within your institution. And it's important to note that when you go to a country, for example, you, you are applying for, for research compliance in Uganda, they want to see authorization within Uganda. So within the compliance process, there is an in-country research authorization. So you might find if you're working like at Ilri or Roslyn or whatever institution you're working in, if it's not in Uganda, then you have had your in, in your institutional approval, but you may need to send your institutional approval to a committee in the country, for example, Uganda, where you are implementing your project. And uh, you will have to send it to, the, to a committee that does that uh, approval. So if you need ethics approval, you'll need to look for an ethics committee in that country. If you need uh, animal uh, ethics and welfare approval, you will go through an ICOOC in that country. And if you need an IBC, you will need to go through an IBC in that country. So that is the first thing that we do within countries. If we don't have a registration within that country, and that's as ILRI, there are only two countries where we are registered to do research, and that is in Kenya and in uh, Ethiopia. So in Kenya and Ethiopia will be treated like any local research institution in those two countries. The other countries we will have to work through, either where we have a host country agreement with the government, or we will work through our partners within that uh, country. 
Then the second thing we do is we have to map out providers. I think many of you, when you're doing the research, you just think of you'll go get your materials from the farmers, come back, do what you need to do in the labs, and then buy a bank. But for us in compliance, we have to map up who are the providers of your material. And the providers could be listed differently. There could be state agencies. So you go to a state agency, like if you're picking, picking the warthogs, I heard some of you talk about it. Most of it is under state agencies of wildlife. You may be using a state agency facility like Calro. So you are using a state agency facility. You may want to, to pick in devel devolved government units. A lot of our governments have been devolved. Like in Kenya here, we have the counties. Same as in Tanzania, I see the same thing in Ethiopia. In Uganda, it's not totally devolved, but they still have the districts and you have to ensure that you have notified up to that uh, level. Then we have also private individual stroke entities. Some of you would like to pick your genetic resources uh, from private individuals, people who own big farms where they have conserved some of these materials for years. And that is where you need to pick your material. So you need to talk to those private individual stroke entities. And uh, some of the materials are held with farmer associations. And this has become very popular that uh, people form farmer associations that they use for preserving their genetic materials. And then some of the genetic materials are held in local community, especially if you're going to communities which are uh, re regarded as uh, vulnerable communities, you have to go through their, commu their local community leadership for you to get any genetic resources from them. So once we've done the mapping of your providers and we are able to, to advise you on who these providers are, and each providers will have their own regulatory framework on how to access material from them. Then from that, then we, we map your users because sometimes you alone are going to ask for these materials, but at the end of it, when we read through your project, you'll be sharing those materials, you'll be sending some maybe to Uganda. I had many of you, you people share in the chat, could you send us some to do this? But whoever picked that material may have not uh, included you. So that is why we have to map up the users and recipients of the materials. So those are partners in your project. And it's so important where you know your partners you, you notify, you, you make it clear in your proposal so that we include them. Then we go to the external process and the external process goes through what we call agreements for access and transfer of genetic resources. Because uh, when you look at uh, the Nagoya protocol, it was quite clear that uh, genetic resources belong to countries. So there is nothing that belongs to an individual PI. A genetic resource belongs to a country. The intellectual property that you add to that genetic resource, then that intellectual property belongs to you. But the GR, the genetic resources, belong to countries. And that is why when you are accessing genetic resources from countries, you must go into agreements to access and transfer the genetic resources. And the tools that I use, we usually have what we call the prior informed consent. And this is the document that you develop and agree on before you go and pick genetic resources. It's prior, it is agreed on before you go to the field to pick. So you enter into agreement with the people, with the, 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 the people you'll be collecting the genetic resource from, whether it's a government entity, an individual entity, a local community, you, you agree on a prior informed consent. Then as you develop a prior informed consent, then you develop what we call mutually agreed terms. So prior informed consent will just uh, be a consent form which the, 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 the people, the, part, the people you are collecting the material from just agree to the fact that you're going to collect material from them. But the mutually agreed terms now are able to outline on what terms are you collecting those material. And that is usually very clear. What we are seeing at the moment is there is a lot of um, lack of knowledge at country level. So when we go into writing the mutually agreed terms is a real difficult negotiation because most countries think that when you pick the GRs, you are going to use them as researchers to make lots of money out of patents. So that is what is in the mind of a lot of the people that we negotiate mutually agreed terms with. And it takes us time for them to understand that 
maybe even IP may not come out of it and the issue of public good, which is what governs a lot of our research here at Ilri, but it's something that you have to develop prior to collecting the materials. Then um, here at Ilri, we have collaborative research agreements. So here you, you develop an agreement because if you're collaborating with other people, you have to do your collaborative research agreement and come out clear who owns what, what IP goes to what, what is so and so's contribution, so that when you come to the issue of publication, you don't have issues. So if you have many partners, you must agree on how things will work. And then after that, now we'll go collect the materials. And if we are moving the materials to different partners, then we develop what we call the material transfer agreement. Most of us have had this uh, wrong uh, thinking that you only do an MTA when you're moving materials out of the country. That is not the situation. If you move material from uh, Ilri, Nairobi to Cairo in Nairobi, you need an MTA because you're moving material from one institution to the next institution, even if you are partners in the, in the project. Anytime you move material, you must put in a material transfer agreement to agree on what you are moving what kind of IP was on that material, what, where are you moving, and what is the other person going to do with the material. So you have to be very clear on the material transfer agreement. And this goes to even moving the materials out of the country. And in this case, actually, what happens is the people who have given you the GR are tracking their material. So at this point, you need to be very clear what will happen to those material when they have moved from the person who collected them from the field to the next user. Is the user going to use the material, return them to the first uh, person who picked the material? Is he going to, to destroy them? This is what we have seen when we take materials out for sequencing. This was very difficult, but eventually we convinced a lot of the government regulators that after sequencing, maybe all they need they can do is just uh, dis destroy the, the DNA. And that's why you see most times, most regulators don't want you to move blood. They want you to move DNA. Because if all you need to do is do sequencing, then they ask us, why do you want to move blood for sequencing? Do the analysis for the DNA and just move out DNA. So it's important for you to, to, to know as the researchers in this area that there are regulations that are coming in place. And in most countries, we are being uh, asked to do the DNA on the ground and not move the whole blood sample because a lot of this knowledge is now available in most of the countries where we are doing the, the research. Or sometimes at the best, they may just ask us to move to Ilri Nairobi, you know, to one center where we do the DNA and move out, but they won't want us to transfer the blood to, to multiple partners just because they want to take care of their genetic resource. And then we draft and submit. So once we've gotten all these documents ready, we draft them and submit for review by all parties. So for the document to be signed, all parties, all your partners, all the government regulators, all the groups where you're picking your materials, all these people, their representatives must review and agree. And then we use templates issued by government lead agencies. And I just want to talk about this because I, I had Mary talk about uh, um, African Union templates. I really do not know what happens because I've heard so many times of the African Union led developed templates, but the truth of the matter on the ground is when we get to the countries, they ask us to use their own templates. A lot of countries have already developed so many of these templates, including MTAs, PICs, MAT, so in countries where they've already developed, they ask you to use their own. The good news is those documents don't vary much, but you just find in some areas, some countries are more strict than others. So those require more negotiation. Then we organize meetings to negotiate agreements. And I want to emphasize this. It is very difficult to do a genetic resource agreement on email or even over the phone. The first one is usually difficult. Once you've done the first agreement and now you know one another with the regulatory agencies in the in country, then it's possible to process them on mail or by phone. But the first ones that you need to enter into the first negotiation, develop your first PIC, develop your first mutually agreed terms, 
develop your first MTA to move material, a lot of this require meetings. And what we see in countries is as much as countries have developed their, their regulatory framework, in some countries, they have never implemented that framework. So when you apply, you become like one of the first applicants to ask for maybe uh, multiple users and, and such things that they're not used to. So they ask you, why must you send to three countries? Why send to four countries? Just send to one country and get everything done. So we, you really must go in and uh, help them understand that some of your projects are written that way that uh, you have to send to various countries. So just finally to talk about the documents generally that you will require so that you have that knowledge, you need a standard proposal and research tools. And when most countries, when they talk of standard proposal, this is, a, this is not a concept not. They want a standard proposal, methods, research questions. You know, a standard proposal, just like the one you do for your PhD masters, that's the kind of proposal they're looking for. And that's what most of the regulatory systems are looking for. Then they want to see your research tools. If you say you'll use questionnaires, where is the questionnaire? So they have to see clearly, or if you're using a method, where is the SOP? Then they want to see an ethics approval letter for human and or animal work. So they, you must give them an ethics approval letter. And this letter must come from a, a recognized ethics committee in country. So th that is one thing that you must present to them. And then they also need funding stroke award letter for the project. This is also another area that we've seen a lot of scientists, especially those of you who run big projects uh, struggle because you are projects and it's just one bit of the project that is working in the country. So if I'm applying, like I've seen a lot of your projects in CTLG, you're working in multiple countries and you may just have a budget for Uganda, another one for Tanzania and Ethiopia as different. What they want is the funding stroke award letter of that project. And then you need to be clear and say the exact money that is going to be spent in a specific country for the project work in country. So those are the things. And I know sometimes we ask for these things and many of you wonder why, but that is what the regulatory system, and this is across the Eastern African countries. All of them ask for the same documents. And then they want the identification document of the applicant. So we have to show them your passport, your ID, your, some of them even ask us for your, 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 your transcript. They ask, depending, they would ask, but they just want to show, to give them identification documents of the applicant. A lot of it could just be, if you work like for an institution that is registered or it's known, then if the institution gives you a cover letter, that is usually quite good. Then they want to see the CV of the applicant. So you have to give us your CV, at least a summary CV, but a scientific CV, because they want to find out who is this applicant, are they qualified? So governments are doing quite a bit of review of the work we submit to them. Then they want evidence of affiliation with a local institution. And this is an area that we really have to work in various, most of the countries. I think at CGR, this is, we, we work with other affiliation uh, institutions in country and we are able to get these um, affiliation letters out uh, uh, for you. So in countries where maybe we don't have a CGR office or an ILRI office or anybody hosting us as an institution, then we have to have an affiliation with a local institution. But in most of the countries now that we are doing running in the project, we already have those affiliations. So all we do is we issue this letter. So we'll just issue the letter, we'll draft it. We already have templates. It will go to the local uh, institution there. They get it signed and then we attach to the application. And then if you if it's a student, then you'll need, you'll need also a letter from the university where you are registered as a student. So the external process, the process tabulates with issuance of a research permit. So the first thing that they give us is the permission to do research. So that is the first document that will issue us and then the uh, approval from subject matter authority. So subject matter authority is you find in countries, if you go like to, uh, if I give an example of Uganda, Uganda, the Uganda National Council of Science and Technology will issue us the research permit and are the same ones who will issue us the ABS permit or that the same one. But you find 
It is MAIF, the Ministry of Agriculture in Uganda, that will issue us a permit to work with uh, animals. So you find those are two institutions you've gone to. Now, when you come to a country, when you go to Ethiopia, you will need a research permit. Ethiopia right now are not quite keen on research permits. They just want to see that you work with a, a, a registered local institution, but you'll need approval from subject matter authority. So subject matter authority in, uh, in Ethiopia would be Ministry of Agriculture and your access permit will be is issued by uh, Ethiopian Biodiversity Institute. And then your export permit, you will go back to Ministry of Agriculture. So the process usually goes around many institutions. In Kenya, it's even more complicated. Your permit to do research comes from National Council of Science and Technology. Your subject matter uh, authority is a Department of Veterinary Service if you're working with domesticated animals. And then your access permit is given by uh, the, the NEMA National Environmental Authority. And your export permit, you go back to DVS, Department of Veterinary Service. So it takes a bit of movement across. And that's why you saw in one of my slides, we have to do mapping of the regulators. So after you've been given your permit and you've gone to the field, there is what we call post approval requirements. And I don't know if any of you look at your permits, all your permits come with conditions. One of the conditions is there is a time to your permit. So you always have to check and ensure that when your permit reaches time for renewal, you, sub, you resubmit it for renewal. And then there is also always a condition for submission of periodic reports. At the moment, most countries is yearly. Some countries is uh, every six months. There are a few that every quarter, but we try to push back on quarterly because those are too often. And then we have to notify countries before publication. Please note that countries don't take it nice when we publish things out there that we've not notified them of that publication. So that subject matter authority, like if it's uh, you're working with uh, uh, livestock, you need to find the Department of Veterinary Service or Ministry of Agriculture where that uh, uh, work who is responsible in that country and make sure you have notified them. And notifying them is not calling a friend on phone or write, writing them an email, no. You write an official letter to government. So you address the right person, in most cases is the CEO, uh, the CEO of that organization and then notify them of your uh, publication before you actually publish. publish. And then you, you do a submission of the summary of your findings. So as you notify them of your publication, you attach a summary of your findings. What did you find about the project? Even if you don't publish, they want you to give them a summary of your findings at the end of your project. Thank you. So in a short, that is what you require for compliance. And I think just to let you know that uh, at ILRI, we have the office because we know navigating these processes is not easy. So you get in touch with us, we'll be able to help you with compliance across the countries, wherever you need to pick your GR. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Effie, for these clarifications on the movement of animal genetic resources across the region and enlightening the different participants and other researchers on what is really needed to be ensure to ensure that we are complying to the ABS Nagoya protocol and to the national and international regulation. So, um, Musa, maybe you take over if there is any question. Uh, no, I can't see any question here. Um... I think most of the discussions have happened for the previous uh, talks and they've had them going on in the chat. So I think most of the answers have been provided there. Unless someone ask any, has any question for Effie. Any question for Effie? Uh, I guess no? the, the, this is probably something that uh, Christian is one who would probably know, but when it comes to the 
uh, the big projects like the CTLGH one. So Christian, you have like one permit for the entire projects in CTLGH or do each project like those ones if you require individual permits? Yeah, each project, because projects are different and the target and the objective are different, normally they require individual permit. And Effie is working with us on that, so she will, she will still clarify. Effie, mm. I think you need yeah. to step in here. Just to clarify one thing, you can get a research permit for the CTLG project, as long as you have the tools and uh, you have the project proposal. But when it comes to ABS, please note, if you are collecting materials, you may be collecting materials across countries. You need a permit for each country. If you are collecting materials in one country, you may be collecting them over a period of time. So you may need to pick permits as you collect if it's a long uh, project. So it depends. The research permit can be for the whole project, but other, other permits are activity based. So the ABS permit is activity based. Okay. I hope and, I'm clear. And how does the, again, maybe this is for people like me who don't do this bit every day, but how does the ABS or the Nagoya protocol work for things like where you have to do like primordial germ cell conservation? Say, say if someone like June wants to go and take chicken embryos, and the technology is using, say, for example, can only be uh, carried out in the Roslyn, but he has to bring the material. So how does that work? Same process. Yeah. You will just uh, get a research permit. Where are you picking it? If you're picking them from Kenya, you get a research permit in Kenya. And then you get your ABS permit from Kenya. With that, we do your material transfer agreement and we move your materials to Roslyn. So if you're doing it in multiple countries, each yeah. country will get that permit. Because the often thing you hear is, for example, you can't move cells from Nairobi to Edinburgh, for example. I, I don't know whether that is just because, of course, there is a part of uh, disease surveillance and stuff, but it, that has nothing to do with material movement. It's just if you have all the papers, you can still move cells around. I think what you're talking about is the quarantine conditions. And if you can, and there are many ways of moving. That's why we move even diseased cells across. So it yeah. depends on the many methods. You might be asked either to make sure that it's clean cells or you carry out, how do you inactivate? How do you clean the cells? You could use um, radiation to just make sure you don't move disease from here to there, or you receive them in a containment facility. So there are many ways I've seen as move cells not under CTLG, but we moved cells from Kenya to many countries or even our other countries where we pick material. You just have to abide with the quarantine requirements and the quarantine certificates are issued by the departments of veterinary service or the chief veterinary officers according to the OIE. All right, okay, thanks. Dr. Christian? Yes, please. I have a question for uh, who? Yes, please. Uh, sure. I think yeah. uh, I think it's, it's an outstanding and very advanced technology actually, and uh, I was partially try. Uh, it was partially that uh, that I try to understand, but I have a question here. Uh, he showed that the productivity of the indigenous the chicken from surrogate mothers is about uh, twenty five eggs. I mean six eggs per week. So yeah. the, uh, is that an on-station uh, output or did they try it uh, from the natural environment? No, uh, that's a, because we're doing this uh, in the research facility. So that is from the breeding pen. It's not from the environment. So do uh, you have the plan to try it out in the natural environment? Yes, that's what, that's actually, this is a, uh, in uh, the purpose of this uh, pro uh, project, this project just try to establish a uh, easy, low cost, no tech, and high throughput method. Try to use in the um, uh, low and middle income country. Okay. So you. that is uh, now we have the we demonstrate 
in the research facility environment. And we now want to move to, you know, like uh, Africa or Asia or somewhere. They have lots of indigenous uh, chicken breed. They want to car preserve for a long term. Once, you know, the people found that they are a very valuable trait, they want to use them, but still you need, you know, kind of a live uh, material. You can bring back the chicken. That's the purpose we want to do. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, June. And in fact, June is one of the key person with whom we will be working. Uh, throughout the regional trainings and the effective biobanking. So we we'll have a lot of opportunity to see how that transfer of technologies from the lab or research institute is really moved to the national system and to the real conditions of exploitations. So um, I don't know if there is any other question. Not seeing any coming. If not, guys, thank you. Thank you so much for attending and for supporting. Thank you for your patience. It was very interesting, not able to stop. And we are extended by more than an hour from what we, were, we planned. But it's because all the topics were so interesting and we really need to keep for, uh, moving forward with this agenda. For the uh, term presentation, which unfortunately the volume was not coming out, we make sure that we have it again and share with uh, all of us so that uh, we really capture that potential of primordial germ cells and the pluripotent stem cells for conservations of poultry, uh, pigs, small ruminants, large ruminants, genetic resources and uh, in Africa in general. And we started last week, with, last month with the Southeast Asia, the same activities should be going on uh, there. And we really need this same motivation and your expertise, your footing in the ground to ensure that the technologies are really benefiting to our end users, our farmers. So thank you very much and uh, have a nice evening, nice night.